And now, stand up community subscribers and listeners from around the globe. It's time to stand up with Pete Dominic, where we ask the important questions that impact you, your family, and your community. Such as, will my change in doctors help me forget all that smoking and obesity and start again with a clean slate? And with fierce winter storms knocking out power for my uncle in the mountains, will he have enough winter snow for all those courtesy flushes? <laughs> and now, the podcast host who cheers on lawn inflatable air leaks like a proud dad at the volleyball game, <laughs> Pete Dominic. Ah, uh, yes, indeedly, I do. And a neighbor found a new neighbor with a, a crazy inflatable display. I think I'll share pictures for stand up subscribers only. If you're a listener and not a paid subscriber, you don't get to see those pictures. What a terrible, terrible predicament for you. You should probably sign up right now. But yeah, I take the dog on a almost three mile walk these days, which is a new thing for me. I used to get short walks and then I would go on my own run, but that hurt my foot. I've been taking these long walks and I should probably start running again. But nonetheless, dude had an inflatable everything on his lawn. I'm just insinuating. I'm being sexist. I'm insinuating a guy created this display. I don't know. Maybe it was a, a woman, but... Anyway, there was inflatables all over this lawn. There was the Grinch, who saw Christmas, and Snoopy, and I think there was a Millennium Falcon. Was it that lawn? Anyway, uh, there was a an inflatable nativity scene. Can we draw the line at inflatable nativity scene? Really? Inflatable Jesus, baby Jesus? I mean, just because the the converse of it all is that inflatables are often, and this is one of the things that irks me about these, they deflate. That's the great thing about Christmas lights. During the day, you barely even see them there. And then at night, it gets dark, which it's mostly dark or half dark these days. They light up. But during the day, you, you, you unplug your inflatable, some of you. You know who you are. And it's just lying there like a used condom. And in this case, it was a nativity. It's a nativity scene just deflated. Horrible and blasphemous, I say. All right, well, welcome to the show. It is episode 498 of this podcast, episode 500 on Friday. Pretty exciting. Joining me today is comedian Jackie Cation and constitutional law professor currently at Oberlin, but next year she'll be at Wheaton College where she's just gotten a tenured position. Dr. Miranda Yaver joins me as well. Great conversations with both of these women. Really excited to share them with you. And also, I did announce a new hotline for the show. And if you want to leave a message about what show 500 means to you, that's cool. If you want to write a message, great. I'll share them. I will say the phone is ringing off the hook. I've got uh, five messages right now. You guys are really, really coming through for me. Thank you for, for, sh <laughs> for showing up. Wait a second. All of a sudden, I just checked it, and all of a sudden, there's several more. Okay. Oh, this is more like like 10 or 15 messages. Oh, this is exciting. I like this. Okay, I'm feeling a little bit better right now. But give a call at 209-STAND-UP, 209-782-6387 if you want to share a message about the show and tell what it means to you, make fun of me, compliments, anything you want. I really appreciate it. That is 209 Stand Up right now. Oh my gosh, Kelly Carlin left me a message. Oh, let's play this. Oh, cool. Hey, Pete, it's Kelly Carlin and just wanting to congratulate you on your 500th show. That's amazing. I mean, it's in general just amazing that we're all here still. <laughs> <laughs> But I just wanted to send my love and a hug and a big, big, deep, calming breathing in and breathing out. <sighs> Have a beautiful, beautiful day. Love you. Oh, my gosh. That is so great. Love you, too, Kelly Carlin. Thank you so much. It's only four, uh, show 498. I hope I make it to 500. And so that stands. That is so sweet and really made my day. Wow. And so many of like, there's like uh, 10 or 15 here and, I, and I'll get to all of them and uh, leave a message. 209 stand up. Try to keep it under a minute if you can. If you can't remember the name of the 
or the the number or spell that out, you can look in the show notes. But now let's get to the news, shall we? And then we'll get to my guests. It is time for The Last 24. Brought to you today by GiveWell. GiveWell.org slash stand up. If you want to improve and save more lives, then donate to GiveWell. I'll tell you more about them later. Lots to talk about in today's news, but the Senate passed legislation to raise debt ceiling by $2.5 trillion is now going to the House. And America's U.S. has hit a grim milestone, 800,000 deaths from COVID-19. Question may not be whether the U.S. will reach 1 million fatalities, but rather when experts say, and I think other experts say we already have, is just how they count them. The D.C. Attorney General is suing the Proud Boys Oath Keepers over the January 6th attack. Donald Trump's tax records can now be released by the Treasury Department, according to uh, a judge's ruling. And, of course, everybody's talking about the January 6th commission and the text messages that have been revealed by uh, two Mark Meadows renewing scrutiny of Trump's inaction during January 6th attack on the Capitol. And that is where we will start with the sound that I have gathered for you today. Let's start with Congressman Adam Schiff of California, Democrat. He's on the January 6th committee. He criticized Mark Meadows, former Trump's former chief of staff, for refusing to cooperate with the House Select Committee, even with all his recent public comments and disclosures. And he also was asked by Andrea Mitchell on MSNBC what impact he thinks that these sex messages being revealed will have. The Schiff man, Adam Schiff. Well, I, I can be doing these public interviews uh, first, but I can't uh, talk to Congress about it. Country. It's just an absurd position How to take. Uh, this attack uh, was, and, and I uh, assume he's uh, taking it because he's being instructed to do so by the former president. Uh, those, uh, such as the that, that is, I think, is very law in the case of former president. Contempt of Congress. You're now trying to downplay uh, what was going on that day because you see the sense of urgency that the president do something as that attack is going on. But it also really helps make the case so clear uh, that Meadows should be held in criminal contempt for refusing to testify. If he's going to provide these messages, which he and his counsel acknowledge there's nothing privileged about, uh, how can he now claim that he can't come in and testify about those messages? Uh, How can he go on Fox News and do interviews and say, I can be doing these public interviews but I can't talk to Congress about it. Uh, It's an absurd position to take. uh, And I I assume he's taking it because he's being instructed to do so by the former president. But uh, that is, I think, a very clear case of criminal contempt of Congress. All right, Adam Schiff on MSNBC yesterday. Also on MSNBC with Joy Reid was Ellie Mistal talking about this. And I'm not even going to set it up. Just let her rip, Ellie. I have to start with you, because it really actually doesn't surprise me that what a lot of the folks on Fox are doing is acting, right? It, it, it's thespians. They're out there saying, we're with you, MAGA crowd. But behind the scenes, they were saying, oh, my God, please make it stop. Your thoughts? Yeah, look, the Fox hosts are lying liars who lie. That's that's what they do. And they lied about this. They have lied about other things. And when you haul them into court, for, and sue them for defamation about their lies, they will say in court, no reasonable person takes my show seriously. That was the <laughs> Tucker Carlson literal legal argument. No yes. reasonable person takes myself my show seriously. And so and that worked, by the way. That was a fine legal argument. It got him out of um, of some legal hot water. So we know what they are. They know what what they are. Like everybody is in on the joke except for the gullible white supremacist viewers of Fox News. And that's where we have the problem, right? Like, look, I admit, it's hard for me to talk about because as a black man, I don't got family that watch that channel, right? I don't have family that, like, you know, buys into the white supremacist rhetoric that that channel puts out. But a lot of y'all white people do. You got a cousin, you got an uncle, you got somebody out there who is watching that trash. And you think, you as the reasonable person, think like, oh, it's their fault. They're, they took my daddy. They took my grandpappy. We've, it's, it's Laura Ingram. It's not their fault. It's not Fox News' fault. Your family members are watching that because that is what they believe. Your family members are watching that because it fits the narrative that your family members have. And that's where you have to break the chain. These Fox News hosts, as you said, Joy, they understand that they are entertainers. They are telling the people what they want to hear. We have to work on why the people want to hear it. Who we? As usual, Ellie Mistal not holding back on his take there. Let's head back to the House of Representatives with Hakeem Jeffries giving his take on this, which I also really liked. 
Certainly our hope that Mark Meadows will cooperate with this incredibly important investigation into the events on January 6th. But when the cult leader speaks, the cult members usually fall in line. All right. As I'm putting the show together right now, I'm seeing the news breaking at about 11 o'clock p.m. House has voted to recommend Mark Meadows be charged with criminal intent. The House voted 228 to 208 on Tuesday night to recommend that former Trump chief of staff Mark Meadows be charged with criminal contempt of Congress. The referral will now go to the Department of Justice, which will make a determination on whether to charge Meadows. The DOJ has already charged Steve Bannon with criminal contempt of Congress for his refusal to comply with the subpoena issued by the 1-6 committee. We'll see what they do with Mark Meadows, who is a different case because, well, he was the former chief of staff and working in the White House at the time. Steve Bannon was, of course, hosting a podcast from his shed. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And now let's head back to the House where yesterday Congressman James McGovern of Massachusetts Second District. I love this guy. I've interviewed him a couple of times. I got to get him back on the show. He made comment about how the fact that Fox News was ignoring that its hosts texted the president's chief of staff asking them to call down the forces. Stand by and stand down, please. I think it's notable uh, that as of the start of the meeting, uh, that there has been zero mentions on Fox News of their host text to Mark Meadows. Uh, the text that uh, Ms. Cheney read um, last night at the, at the select committee's um, meeting, not one. And that's, and that's despite the fact that one of the hosts that texted him was live on the air all, mor- all, all morning. There you go, uh, Congressman James McGovern. And, and now let's listen to Liz Cheney, who he mentioned. I was talking to Bill B. in D.C. yesterday, longtime listener and a great political analyst. Didn't tape this one, but he was just talking about how her strategy here to just keep releasing more really important and provocative information, either as it comes in or just each day to keep the story in the headlines and the attention on the January 6th committee investigation is strategically really effective for Liz Cheney and the commission. I'm not sure that's necessarily accurate or that's the plan, but it certainly would seem it is. And it's effective. Liz Cheney is, is doesn't want to mess around with this. She's being very serious about this. And she's very upset with Kevin McCarthy and many of her former colleagues in the Republican House. It's a fascinating development there. Here she is yesterday. As the violence unfolded that afternoon, nearly one year ago, it was evident to all, not only to those of us who were in the chamber at that time. It was covered in real time by almost every news channel. But for 187 minutes, President Trump refused to act. Let's let that sink in, Madam Speaker. He refused to act. When action by our president was required, it was essential, and it was compelled by his oath to our Constitution. Yeah, the gloves are off for old Liz Cheney, and she means business. Now, here's CNN's Manu Raju asking another Republican a question about this developing story. Mitch McConnell Hey, did you send any texts to Mark Meadows? Who else texted him? We are learning from the House Select Committee that a number of Republicans have reached out to Mark Meadows asking for Donald Trump to get more involved and do more on January 6th to secure this building. Were you personally in contact with Mark Meadows that day and other White House officials to urge Trump to do more? Yeah, I, I was not, but I do think we're all watching, as you are, what is unfolding on the House side. And it um, will be interesting to reveal all the uh, participants who were involved. And, of course, the House took this vote on contempt, criminal contempt for Mark Meadows yesterday. But there's a whole lot of floor speeches made, including by the absolutely unhinged Marjorie Taylor Greene. And I'm going to play about a minute and a half for you. You're going to it's worth it because then I've got Jamie Raskin's response to her and listening to her Versus him, it's like listening to like a first grader or third grader argue with like a 
someone in grad school. A gentlewoman from Georgia is recognized. We've heard a lot about text messages. I'd like to the Democrats and the people on the January 6th committee to produce their text messages, Mr. Speaker, denouncing Antifa BLM riots that raged across American cities for a year. I would love to read those. But instead, we saw Democrats encourage, incite, and continue to call these riots peaceful. And then when they got arrested and put in jail, they bailed them out so they could go out and riot some more. I rise in opposition to this resolution to hold Mark Meadows in contempt of Congress because it's being held by nothing but a kangaroo court. Congress's job is to make laws, not enforce them. That's the role of the executive and the judicial branch of this government. But somehow the communists here in charge have forgotten, or no, not forgotten, are purposely abusing the Constitution and what this, this body of Congress is supposed to do. You see, when we go to this level to the point where we're forgetting and abusing what our power is, then the American people will trust us no more. And that is exactly what the January 6th committee is doing. All right. And now listen to Jamie Raskin's response to Marjorie Taylor Greene. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Mr. Speaker, hundreds of people have come forward to testify about the violent and dangerous events of January the 6th. It's just a handful of people like Mr. Bannon, like Mr. Meadows, who somehow think that they're above the law. We are not a banana republic because we hold everybody to equality under the law, and we are not communists, as the gentlelady from Georgia suggested. That's just the friends of the former president who you lionize, like the dictator of North Korea, who he loves, and Vladimir Putin, who said that the greatest tragedy of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. So those are your friends. Don't put them on our side. They're saying that the January 6th committee is out to persecute and bankrupt their opponents. On the contrary, we're out to write a report under House Resolution 503 to the American people about the most violent and sweeping dangerous attack on the republic since the Civil War or the War of 1812. Mr. Bannon's raising money on it. Far from bankrupting Mr. Bannon, he's trying to get rich on it. And Mark Meadows has written a book where he tells all of the stories he wants about January the 6th. It's just he doesn't want to face the rule of law and the questions of this bipartisan committee, which is making tremendous progress in terms of getting the truth of what happened on that day. I recommend to all of my colleagues who invoke the rule of law today that they read the D.C. Circuit Court of Opinion, which obliterates every single argument that they've made about executive privilege. It's basically gone now because the way the law works is the people have a right to get the information we want unless there's a compelling interest on the other side. They haven't even pretended to to invoke a compelling interest. What's the compelling interest in being able to prepare an insurrection, a coup against the government? Is that what we want to establish a precedent for? that outgoing presidents can try to organize an insurrection against the vice president and encourage people who go out and stage a riot against the vice president of the United States in the Congress? I don't think so. A couple of the speakers said there was an absence of legislative purpose. This is the central purpose of our government, to make the government survive and to go out and serve the people. That's what this committee is doing. He is in contempt, uh, Mr. Speaker. I urge a yes vote on the rule in the previous question. And they got a yes vote, and that's Jamie Raskin, who is always very effective rhetorically and not a guy you want to argue with. And a guy who has appeared right here on this podcast, I should get him back on. Great Jamie Raskin. And now let's listen to... Jen Psaki taking a question on this in yesterday's White House press briefing. Any response to the revel- revelations that uh, that GOP lawmakers uh, were texting uh, uh, Chief of Staff Meadows along with prominent uh, Fox News host uh, ahead of the uh, during the January 6th riots? Well, it's disappointing and unfortunately not surprising that some of the very same individuals who are willing to warn, condemn, and express horror over what happened on January 6th in private were totally uh, in private were totally silent in public, uh, or even worse, uh, were spreading lies and conspiracy theories and continue to since that time. So disappointing, not surprising. Unfortunately, we've seen a trend from some of the same individuals. Okay, Jen Psaki having none of it and uh, naming names. Let's listen to a Republican, Michael Burgess from Texas, who equated January 6th to 
protests during the Obama administration about Obamacare. I, I don't remember those getting violent, and there certainly weren't any cops killed. But don't let that comparison stop you, Congressman Burgess. We've had bad protests here at the Capitol before. I was here when the Affordable Care Act went through the legislative process. You don't think we had some really upset people outside the Capitol during those days? Of course we did. We are, this is one of the, it's what we do here. But where was, where was the preparation Okay, I don't even know what he's talking about. What a bizarre moment yesterday for Congressman Burgess, although I'm sure he thinks it was a great performance. Here is Eric Swalwell. I think this is the final congressman I've got for you on this. And and below the surface, they're collecting, you know, the documents, they're interviewing witnesses, and they're going to, you know, curate the ones that I think best tell the story so the country knows just exactly who's responsible and what we have to do to make sure it doesn't happen again. That's going to happen after the new year. And again, I think you're going to find uh, that this is a party, the Republican Party, led by Donald Trump, uh, that has become more comfortable with violence than voting when it relates to elections. Okay, well, Sean Hannity and I guess I guess the rest of them, they they did address it later last night. They had a day to think of whatever they want. And here's a little bit of Hannity. I got to give it to you. I got to hannitize you. I'm sorry. Tonight, I will address Liz Cheney. I will address the sham January 6th committee. I will address the dishonest media mob and their BFF friends in the Democratic Party. But we begin tonight. He said, we begin tonight with a story from a school in California where a white family has been minimized and marginalized. Now, I I don't know what he talked about, probably something about burning books and aggrieved white people. But here he is. Here here, here he is, uh, Sean Hannity, going into it for a minute. This is this is his spiel. In a weak attempt to smear yours truly, and presumably, I guess, President Trump, Congresswoman Cheney presented one of my text messages from January 6th to Mark Meadows. Uh, Surprise, surprise, surprise. I said to Mark Meadows the exact same thing I was saying live on the radio at that time and on TV that night on January 6th and well beyond January 6th. And by the way, where is the outrage in the media over my private text messages being released again? And publicly. Do we believe in privacy in this country? Apparently not. It's not my first rodeo, like the thousands of Hannity text messages released to the public over the years in FOIA requests, other leaks. Uh, I am an honest, straightforward person. I say the same thing in private that I say to all of you. Liz Cheney knows this. She doesn't seem to care. She's interested in one thing and one thing only, smearing Trump and purging him from the party. And all right. Well done, Hannity. But just to be clear, he, he definitely didn't say the same thing. He said it was Antifa. They all did. So just to be clear, here's Tucker Carlson. A couple seconds of Tucker. These are principled people. What they say in public is not that far from what they say over text message. If you get a text from Brian Kilmeade, it sounds pretty much identical to Brian Kilmeade on Fox and Friends. These are not phonies. We can personally confirm that whether you like them or not. They're These are not per- what we can personally confirm that these people are are not phonies. <laughs> I mean, that whole thing was laughable. They're the phoniest of phony, of course. But let's head back to Hannity, where Geraldo, who's outrageous and ridiculous, but sometimes tries to talk sense into Hannity, tried to talk sense into Hannity. I beg you, Sean, to remember the frame of mind you were in when you wrote that text on January 6th, and when Laura did, and when Brian did, and when Don Jr. did. Remember the concern you had. Remember the the frustration you had at our, our beloved 45th president. Yeah, because Where I wanted, was he? I wanted how, a riot to end. How can he be end? doing this? Why doesn't he say something? Why? Okay, but, and he but, bet, you and, wanted, but the point you is saw, he did. You saw, unfolding before your, he you did. saw unfolding before your very eyes an attack on democracy. Let me give it to an Dan. An attack on the Constitution. The point, an attack but, but he the did not call for that. United States he of said America. peacefully, and then he did do it. Dan, you have less than a minute. Or Actually, you know what? We're out of time. Sorry, Dan. Insufferable Dan Bongino. Oof. All right, let me change gears at least a little bit here. I thought it was, uh, I mentioned this just at the very top, but really important story. Here it is from the Washington Post. The headline reads, D.C. Attorney General sues Proud Boys Oath Keepers over January 6th attack. The D.C. Attorney General Carl A. Racine on Tuesday sued the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers 
over the January 6th attack in Congress, seeking to use a law written to cripple the Ku Klux Klan to seek stiff financial penalties penalties from the far right groups that the attorney general alleges were responsible for the violence. And a similar lawsuit led to a $26 million verdict last month against more than a dozen of the nation's most influential white supremacists and hate groups for their deadly role in the 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. That trial evidence drew heavily on the defendant's text messages, social media posts, and videos to reconstruct how they conspired in advance of the violence. And this civil suit was put together with the assistance of two nonprofit groups that focused on the January 6th assault, the State's United Democracy Center and the Anti-Defamation League, led by my friend Jonathan Greenblatt, who I'll try to get on to talk about it. And here is the D.C. Attorney General Carl Racine yesterday. While some desperately want to rewrite history and sweep the events of January 6 under the rug, the District of Columbia and its residents have chosen to speak truth through this filing, through this complaint, through this case. It is for these reasons that the independent office of attorney general for the District of Columbia is filing the first civil lawsuit by a state or municipal government to hold accountable the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, and more than 30 of their leaders and members for conspiring to terrorize the District of Columbia for unlawfully interfering with our country's peaceful transition of power and for assaulting our men and women in blue who valiantly defended the Capitol, the district, and our freedoms. Yeah, that'll be an interesting story to follow, and I'll try to get the Anti-Defamation League's Jonathan Greenblatt on the show. I should get him back on the show with Wajahad Ali, who I saw them together performing, like or giving a talk together at the Aspen Ideas Fest that I was hosting. Amazing, amazing experience that night. Okay, so two more clips I want to play for you. First, uh, the uh, great Reverend Dr. Benjamin Barber of the Poor People's Campaign absolutely savaging Joe Manchin, who he has been going after for some time now. The Poor People's Campaign had a press conference in front of Senator Manchin's office at the Hart Senate building yesterday, and here he is. That Senator Manchin not only lied to West Virginians, he's lied to the nation. And I'm using that word intentionally because it's provable. And his inaction and his lies about scarcity now, he's saying he's taking these positions, Liz, because we don't have enough and if we spend this now, we got to come back. Those are lies. And it's actually a form of political violence against 140 million poor and low-wealth people in this country. Yes, sir. And especially the people who have suffered during COVID. Yes, sir. Regardless of their color and or their geography. He is engaged in a form of political policy violence. Yes, sir. People will stay sick, people will die, people will not be able to recover. He also never asked these questions about scarcity when it comes to the military or to corporate America. He's never seen a corporate tax break he didn't want to pass or a military budget he wouldn't fund. Exactly. Really nailing it, Reverend Ben Barber, the Poor People's Campaign. Great organization. I highly recommend you follow him on Twitter at RevDRBarber and hashtag Poor People's Campaign. Check them out. Moral Mondays, the Moral Movement. I've been following him for years. Interviewed him years ago, and I know he saw my tweet. I should probably try to get him back on as well. Do I say that about every single clip I play? I'm sorry. That's annoying. Here is the Attorney General of New York, Letitia James. She was on The View, and she told the ladies why she decided not to run for governor. She'd announced to run for governor, and then she took her hat out of the out of the running. Um, I've got unfinished business. I made a I put my hand on the Bible almost three and a half years ago, and I made a commitment to New Yorkers um, that I would serve them as the attorney general to the best of my ability. And when you have outstanding cases, investigations into the Trump organization, into the certain individuals, the NRA, 
big tech focusing on nursing homes and the undercounting of individuals who died as a result of this pandemic. All right. Work to do. And she decides that she's better placed right now to stay at her job as attorney general or who knows why she made that decision. But I thought that was interesting just to play this James because she's still going after Donald Trump. We'll see what happens in New York and the districts that she is in charge of. But I just think it'd be great if it was a black woman that took Trump down in the end. I mean, that's just how I have the screenplay ending, but I'm not sure where you see it going. All right. Well, that's all of the audio that I've got to share with you in the last 24. That's the first 30 minutes of the program. I do the news around that amount of time, 20 to 35 minutes, I suppose. If I'm really being honest, it varies depending on what I find for the audio. But now I've got just the rest, the headlines, as I call it. It's time for your news dump and a brand new jingle from Pete Coe, who never stops entertaining us. Time for family Christmas tree, but cats are in a huff. An emerging venomous snake on today's news dump. (laughs) <laughs> oh, boy, that really scared me. I don't like that snake sound effect. Another great one from Pete Cole. I don't even want to know what that story is based on. All right, let's see what else we got for you. News dump, rapid fire, headlines. Come at you. Starting with the vote that I mentioned this already, I think. The bill to raise the debt ceiling by $2.5 trillion. The House expected to pass the same measure And they are voting literally as I'm talking at midnight on Tuesday night. I don't know if it'll be done by the time I'm done with the news dump, but the U.S. will never default. So borrow forever. Continue raising the debt limit. Nobody cares about the debt limit. Let's stop talking about that. Okay, the Air Force has discharged discharged 27 active duty members who refused to get vaccinated against COVID-19 as required. According to a spokesperson Monday, the Pentagon has required vaccinations for members of the military. And the deadline for active duty Air Force members was November 2nd. Other branches have different deadlines. Uh, And this is an interesting story about Pfizer's clinical trial. Additional data saying that their their oral COVID-19 antiviral drug confirms that the treatment's high level of effectiveness, the company said in a news release Tuesday. This is this is good news. Hope this works out. In the final analysis of phase two of three in the clinical trial, the antiviral called Paxilovid was found to be 89% effective at preventing high-risk people from being hospitalized or dying from COVID. Major good news. Also, the first major real-world study of the Omicron COVID-19 variant found that it appeared to cause less severe illness in South Africa, where it first discovered last month. But two doses of the Pfizer vaccine offer reduced protection against it. The latest on the devastation in Kentucky, more than 100 people in the state were still unaccounted for. 74 confirmed dead. Governor Andy Bashir said in an afternoon update before surveying storm damage in Muhlenberg County, where the governor himself apparently lost relatives. And for the past six months, families with kids have received monthly payments from the federal government as part of the expanded tax child tax credit policy that apparently has slashed child poverty in the U.S. If Congress doesn't act, however, this measure is set to expire in 17 days, pressing deadline on that. Interesting story to watch from the University of Florida, where they're investigating possible violations of its research integrity policy following a 274-page faculty committee report that included claims of pressure to destroy and barriers to publish COVID-19 data. And I talked about that with Dr. Michael Mann and Dr. Peter Hotez. We talked about it specifically as it relates to Florida, and that is a really important story to watch. And, of course, yesterday was a grim and horrible anniversary, the nine-year anniversary of the 2012 Sandy Hook elementary school shooting. And President Joe Biden addressed families of the victims. And I somehow missed audio of that, but he called it an unconscionable act of violence and added, as a nation, we owe these families more than prayers. We owe them action. O.J. Simpson's parole has ended early. He is now a, quote, completely free man. 74-year-old former football star acquitted California murder defendant, convicted Las Vegas armed robber, was granted good behavior credits and discharged from parole effective December 1st. So who is going to make money off of whatever reality show he is going to do? 
stocks on Wall Street dropped after a, the latest inflation report. And three Republicans in Florida, speaking of Florida, have been accused of voter fraud. Authorities say retirees cast ballots in more than one state. There is voter fraud. It's very little. And it's almost always Republicans. As a matter of fact, reporter from Mother Jones, who covers this better than anybody, anybody, Ari Berman, tweeted actually about this uh, statistic or this case. He writes, every significant case of voter fraud in 2020 was committed by Republicans. How about it? Google announced that unvaccinated employees will lose pay and eventually be fired. And that's a major announcement from a, a really big, important company. Uh, the fastest growing U.S. religious affiliation, according to a new poll from the Pew Research Center, is none. When asked about their religious identity, 29% of respondents, or about 3 in two, 10 U.S. adults, said they had none, meaning they were atheists, agnostic, or, quote, Nothing in particular. Number of people in the U.S. who describe themselves as religiously unaffiliated has increased by six points in the last five years and 10 points in the last decade. And that must be what's wrong with our planet. And that is also your news dub. Okay, well, I've got two great guests joining me today, a scholar and a comedian and I'm not sure. Well, you know what? To be honest with you, Dr. Miranda Yaver, who I'm referring to as a scholar, has also done a lot of stand-up comedy. And uh, during our conversation today, I asked her if she might return to it now that she's moving to Boston. And she said she probably is going to. So that's interesting. But first, before that, I've got the great Jackie Cation, who I've been wanting to get on the show for a long time. Very funny comedian. She's got an awesome new album coming out. But before I get to my guests today, did you know that Hundreds of millions of people live on less than a dollar ninety per day. Hundreds of millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people, mostly children under the age of five, die every year from malaria. Did you know it costs about five dollars to provide one bed net to prevent malaria? Nets can reduce the number of malaria infections. Enough nets and a large enough drop in infections can save a life in expectation. It costs about $7 to treat a child through the malarial high season. These treatments can reduce the number of malaria infections and in enough treatments also save a life and an expectation. I mean, we talk so much about COVID and we don't think about these diseases that are killing children around the world every day. It costs about a dollar a day to deliver a vitamin A supplement to a child. Vitamin A deficiency can increase mortality rates. Vitamin A distributions can save a life by reducing vitamin A deficiency. And the charities that give well rates, reviews, and investigates are doing this work. They do the research to find these amazing charities, which is why the Boston Globe calls GiveWell.org the gold standard for giving. And the only question you really want to ask when you give to charity is how much impact will your donation actually have? And this question can be hard, if not impossible to know. Most charities can't tell you how much of your money will be used or how much good it's going to accomplish. You may know it'll theoretically help a cause, but how, or more importantly, how much? If you want to help people living in poverty and save and improve lives with evidence-backed, high-impact charities, I recommend you check out Give Well. Go to givewell.org slash stand up. That's givewell.org slash stand up. And if you are making your first donation to the organization, they will match it up to $250. It's the giving season, folks. If you're looking for something to do, and this helps support the show as well, working with GiveWell has been a really huge pleasure. And last year, we far exceeded our goal, and I hope that we can this year as well. Givewell.org slash stand up now or later, whenever you want. And there's a link to it in the show notes as well as all of the rest of the sponsors of the show, too. OK, well, I'm very excited to share my conversation with comedian Jackie Cation. Jackie and I really don't know each other that well. We've crossed paths several times, but we mostly came up in different parts of the country at a little bit different times. She's been doing comedy just a little bit longer than me, but she's had a tremendous amount of success as a nationally touring comic for over 25 years. She is the creator and host of the Dork Forest podcast. She also is the co-host of a podcast with Lori Kilmartin, who's a good friend and has been on the show many times. The Jackie and Lori show, which I highly recommend. 
and get her new album, which I play a clip from. It's called Staycation. Ladies and gentlemen, on Twitter, at Jackie Cation. So happy to have her on the show. We had a great conversation. I think you're really going to like it. Jackie Cation. 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 It's actually the middle one, and that's the whole play on the word with your new album, but yet that I has been giving you headaches your whole life. <laughs> Welcome to the show, and thank you. It has. It has indeed. Because thanks for having me. And yeah. hilariously, I was introduced the other night as just a new album called Staycation. Please welcome Jackie Kashian. Oh, and I was like, oh, so close. So close. Yeah, that's but, tough. Uh, yeah. That's but tough. A couple of my we, we've always said Kashian, but a couple of my siblings. And when I say a couple, three out of the six of us have decided in the last 10 years to go ethnic, just as ethnic as anybody who wants to introduce me. Why would they? Is that a bit of a problem with the family? Is there a text chat? Is there an announcement? Why would they do this? I don't know, but they know that um, my dad has always said Cation. Uh, and then, but my oldest brother, my youngest brother, and my older sister, my youngest to my older brothers, and my sister, um, I don't know why I qualified that. You guys don't know them. So it doesn't matter. Three of my <laughs> siblings out of the, out of the five. I've decided to go cash in or cash in or something like that. Wow. And the, the other there. So we're split again for, for a long time. We were split politically. Now we're just split uh, with the pronunciation of our own last name. Are you split p- politically? Why do you have so many siblings? Uh, well, we're split on that, too. Why? Why do we have so many siblings? What is as my sister has always said? You know, the condom was invented in the 1700s. I don't understand. And she's the second. I'm the youngest. She's the next oldest. And people are always like, well, if they would have used birth control, you wouldn't have been born. And she always says, I would have been born a Rockefeller like I was supposed to be. Anyway. uh What? That is amazing. (laughs) I've never even thought about what I was supposed to be if I wasn't this. Right. It would have been would have been fine. You would have been born in some other iteration. I don't think I would be. I don't think I would be like, I think I am. I think I am. And I think if I were not this, I wouldn't be. This is a philosophical thing. But my sister has held this view since she was 11 years old. It's like a like a Calvinist or something. Who is it that (laughs) you're born into your your social status or something? Yeah, I think it's the caste system in India. And (laughs) there's that. Yeah. The apartheid system here in America. Yes. Well, I, I um listen, I just want to say, you know, I, I could talk about any of these kinds of issues and philosophy and life and religion and, 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 and gender and, and, and any of it with you because you're so you've thought about it so much. And you've you, I feel like you found a way to make it funny with actually without being divisive. Like I actually in your new album, you talk about sexism and I started thinking of it from another point of view. I'm like, I love this. This is hilarious. But I wonder if there's like asshole kind of toxically masculine guys that would chauvinist, whatever you want to call them, that would also be like, I think this is funny. This is fine. This is funny. I almost feel <laughs> like you're getting away with a critique without being divisive, which is super hard these days. How do you feel about my thoughts about your the, the material and how you're presenting it? I love your thoughts on the material because I was just talking about this with Lori Kilmartin in the fact that we are aggressively trying to make everyone laugh. You know, like um, I want the talk the I have done so many gigs in the Dakotas and Nebraska and Minnesota and Michigan where there is at least two or three dudes in the audience who are arms crossed, just going, there's no way this woman who looks like my little sister or my aunt is going to make me laugh. And then, and I'm like, and it is on me, by the way, because it isn't cool. I mean, a disproportionate amount of my energy can sometimes, and I've learned to, I've learned to split it. But uh, but sometimes I'm like, oh, no, it's that guy. It's that lady. It's that person that I yeah. need to make. Just crack a smile because and because I can see them and 220 other people yucking it up, feel having the time of their lives. But um, but I do. It's p- part of it is I want to make everybody laugh. I want to make and people I wouldn't hang out with people I would invite to the house, people I wouldn't have a freaking cup of coffee with. I want to make them laugh when we're all in that room. I can't feel it. Like, it's just one of those things where it's kind of almost boring and uninteresting to talk about. And you just have to listen to the album because us talking about what you're doing is is one thing. <laughs> or we could just play it and, and people could listen and you could hear what Jackie's doing. But I, I tr- 
that's my interpretation of what you're doing. It's super hard right now to talk about certain issues and topics anywhere, much less on stage. And like you said, you want to make everybody laugh. But I think you are doing it in a way um, that is not um, triggering to certain people that would maybe be offended by your opinion because the points that you're making. And I just I can't say much more because I would be then talking about it. Go listen to the album. Go buy the album and get enlightened yourself because Jackie is super original and doing my brother sent me a clip from this album, which is why I reached out to you. I'm like, that's it. He's my comedy God, he made he made me right. right like right. You, somebody makes everybody yes. and my older brother made me. And so for him to send that to me, I'm like, I know Jackie, like I don't know Jackie, but I've always known you, your work and respected your work. Yeah. And I was like, for you to send that to me means like it doesn't matter what what, what anything ha- happens in your career in terms of what you're doing. The best thing that could happen to you for me is that my brother sends a clip <laughs> of you. Right. As, and I'm going to bask in that because that is uh, that is a success that. It, it beats an end of the year list, Pete. And uh, as much as I want, as much as I want a three special deal with with Netflix, but it's um, even one, quite honestly. Uh, is, does anybody's uncle work for Netflix? But the, uh, but I will say that um, I I have a good friend. I have probably two friends left from high school, right? And um, one of the clips I've had a couple of clips go viral, right? And the first one that went viral was the one about the rapture. And my buddy Stefan is a rapture guy. Can I just can I just play it? Yeah, go for it. For people who wish it to be the end times right now, because they want to get to the rapture. <laughs> they think it's the end times. They want it to be the end times because they want to speed it up, get to the rapture. Here's the twist. They've decided that they're going to be horrible people. To speed up the end times to get to the rapture. Let's unpack it. First of all, not the end times. Just terrible times. Try to help somebody. Second thing, the rapture. I don't know if you know anything about the rapture. Uh, They're not taking horrible people. Third thing you may not know about the rapture, not real. Not real. Literally a parable to get you to not be a horrible person. (laughs) Okay, so now everybody got to hear the clip about the uh, the rapture. Who is your friend that inspired this? Oh, no, he didn't inspire it. Every uh, every banana head in the world is like the 1% (laughs) of goof Goofy right. end times people have inspired right. it. Right. Uh, my, my my good friend Stefan, uh, who is Catholic, and we had a law, we had a, a, a conversation that was quite honestly slightly too long about because uh, he said that that bit is so funny. Except for your third point, it's not true. Oh, it's uh, the rapture's coming, and I was like, "What did the what did your priest say about that?" And he was like, "This isn't a Catholic thing." And I said, "No." No, it is not. It's an evangelical be scared all the time thing. And he's like, no, it isn't. By the way, there's cell phone towers that are creeping me out right now. Mm. And I'm like, hey, I love you like a brother. But even one of my brothers, I have a hard time talking to. So uh, we're going to have to agree to disagree on this one. That's a good. Did you really say it like that? Yeah, that's a good tactic. Yeah, I, I mean, like the, I always think about how conversations go or more importantly, how they go bad, whether it be my wife or my brother or my dad, like people I argue with, like and feel terrible about. And like in that point that you just made, it's like you, you here's here's a point to pivot. What do I do? Do I burn them down? Because I can. Mm. Or do I say what you said, which I thought that works. And did you and you've maintained that relationship, that friendship to a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just yeah. Uh, it was just two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago. So, yeah, we're still in. It's uh, I did have I will say because two days ago I was at the LAX and I'm going up to uh, I'm in an elevator, tiny elevator. It's me, two other women, middle aged women uh, and, a, and a guy, middle aged dude. And we're all wearing masks. And I say same thing that I've been saying since I started traveling again, just trying to break the ice. I'm always I'm always trying to look for stage time, even in the tiniest elevator in LAX. So we get in and we're kind of packed in a little bit. And I said, it's like 2019 in here, you guys. It's not my finest work, but it got a laugh from people (laughs) during the day, which is all I'm trying to do, Pete. (laughs) I'm super. And so I get a laugh. The two other women laugh and the dude goes, this is all ridiculous. This is just a plot for us having to wear all this stuff. 
And I and we were shocked, the three of us, three women standing there. So I finally I said, you don't like staying alive? And the door opens and he walks out and he goes, I get to say these things. It's free speech. And I said, yeah, me too. Me too. Look what just happened. We just did it. And then I spent the rest of the hour before my flight hoping you didn't come into the Delta Sky Club. <laughs> I know. I know. It's like, <laughs> is it worth it? Uh, but it was my fault. I was the one who tried to be funny in real life, you know? Uh, th- I mean, yeah, f- f- I-, I would definitely like I I think that's a funny enough line that I would withhold my general no small talk on the elevator with strangers rule. Right. Right. Like if that's, someone's going to legitimately make a funny like, but so often people just say anything else, usually about the weather. And I'm like, I don't want to talk. No, no, I I, I don't want to get it. I don't want to have a conversation, but I, uh, you know, three minutes is three minutes. I will try. Oh, that's a Here's, long time. Did you say that? I didn't realize it was, but it but, was not, it was not is, three minutes. It was, a, did, it was an elevator. So it was, luckily it was 45 seconds. Do you ever find, do you ever find yourself, especially someone being as witty and thoughtful as you, like wishing that you recorded all of life to throw it on the podcast? Cause as soon as you just told that story, I was like, is there any audio? <laughs> I, I have to tell you that sometimes I gorilla audio my dad. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just hit record. We're at lunch and he's telling me some story about yeah. how he's trying to sell windows and he's like, you have to double the price so that you could give people a deal. And he genuinely feels that he's giving them a deal once he gives them the regu- the real price. <laughs> yeah. He genuinely is like, no, I gave him a deal. And I was like, yeah, but you told him it was $2,000 a window, Dad. He was like, yeah, but I eventually I sold it to him for 400 a window. Your dad is a central part of your act and even your friend Maria Bamford. I'm just learning about this whole thing where she also uh, oh, talks right? about when you guys sell merch with things he says <laughs> even. I mean, so just my question to you is like, who is this legend? Who is Elliot Cation? He would like he he would love this conversation so much. Um, he well, he's just a he's a guy, right? I mean, and he's a and in many ways, he's a good guy. And in some ways, he is a dick. My brother, Phil, once said, Dad, do you have any regrets? And my dad, without missing a beat, goes, no. And there was this long pause. And my brother, <laughs> Phil, goes, you don't regret anything. And my dad's like, no. And I'm sure, and I'm almost certain that the reason he doesn't regret is kind of a good philosophical reason, is the fact that if he can't change it. Right. And he is a better person today than he was 50 years ago. Right. And, um, but you know, like on, on all of my albums, there's different jokes about him. Right. Um, actually the hero album, the album before this one, there's almost 20 minutes about my dad on it. And I told him that, and he goes, if it's more than 20 minutes, that is not your album. That is my album. Oh my (laughs) God. That's he's awesome. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Fascinating. Um, he, he's con- is he just like a constant? He, he's, I mean, the way you make him sound publicly, I would call him and tape with him every day because it's amazing content for my act or my podcast or whatever. Is, he, is, high, is he a highlight reel? He's uh, well, uh, a long one just because he it is this. You know how it is with your parents. You have to make peace with the with the mistakes they made or the people that they are. Because you have a June Cleaver, you know, idea of what your childhood should have been like. Once you meet other people with other childhoods, you're like, you got a bike? What? And uh, and so, but what I learned from my dad is seriously, amazingly great advice. Like, he is a gambler, right, my father? And uh, he's not good at it. No one is. He's not terrible <laughs> at it. But... I will tell people and they'll be like, you sound cool. And I was like, yeah, I always went on the bike anyway. But the thing is, is um, he, his (laughs) attitude toward money, for example, is it's transparency. He's just like money is there. And it's because of the, I'm I'm certain it's, and he might disagree, but I'm certain it's because of the gambling. He's like, money is to be made and then spent. And then you go find more money and there'll always be more money. And these are things that he said. And I was like, how do you know that there'll always be more money? And he goes, because I have six kids. There has to be more money. And then he's, and the, the, when he told me that, he goes, I got to go find $100. I'll be right back. Oh, my and God. I- <laughs> that is, but is, is, am I hearing you right when he's saying, like, seriously good advice? Like, I have, I have 
these six people who I have to support. So I have to find a way to earn money yeah. to support. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. He, I, it's interesting. He's, yeah. He's not, he's not the guy who's like, I'm overwhelmed. I can't do this. I got to go leaving, you know, what would be my mother to go? Well, right. I, someone has to take care of these kids. Uh, yeah. He was, so my mother, they were both so young, you know, I mean, they were both like, she was 16, 17. He was 18, 19. They got married when <clears throat> she was 18. He was 19. And, wow. um, and then they just kept having kids. And then the only, but he had that fifties mentality where he brings his check home. And that's the end of his responsibility. What, what, well, what kind, do you mind me asking you kind of a fair, I feel like you don't, a personal question. You've already said a lot, but I do uh, have this project that I've been working on for a long time to help dads uh, become good dads to daughters. And cause I have two daughters and it's from a female point of view. So I ask women who I like and admire and respect uh, about their relationships with their dad. In this case, you like you're a perfect person because I like, admire and respect you a great deal. Your work Thank professionally you. and everything I know of you personally. And we know a lot of people who know, your, your, your reputation is excellent. So the question is, you know, what did your dad do right? What did your dad do wrong? You're so uniquely qualified. You've already started to answer that. <laughs> well, here's the great one of the best things about my father is that he is. And this is good. He's listening to this going, if you if you were to, which he isn't, but um, he'd be like, I'm, I'm sending <clears> it directly to him as exactly. soon, before I even he'd, post it. He'd love Elliot. Uh, anyway, so um, but he. He's so self-absorbed that he never t- treated my sister as anything but two more people in his life. We were not treated as girls. We were treated as, you know, people, sales associates. Like people to be trained in how to. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> there. I I, uh, I I do this joke about uh, on one of the first albums. I think is literally the first time I the only time my father addressed that I was a girl. I was fifteen. I was doing homework at the kitchen table. He comes in to the kitchen. It's nighttime. I'm doing my and he goes, "All right, we're gonna have the talk." And I was like, "Oh, what's happening now?" And he goes. The bee goes from flower to flower. The flower does not go from bee to bee. Guess which one you are. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. And uh, here's the weird thing is that he, somebody told me that he stole that from the king and I, which is also par for the course. Uh, (laughs) Well, (laughs) what did, hey, what, I'm just, I don't want to interpret my, what did, what did you at that point think? And what do you think about that now? That idea? The well, what the I should have thought was, you think I'm a flower? Oh, no, I did not. Uh, I, um, <laughs> but he, I mean, I think I literally did. I didn't get it because I didn't understand anything until I was about 19. Right. Okay. Um, so there were gross boys and men when I was a child, but there was not, it wasn't like I was dating. Like I, I like I thought I had any agency with my body. So um, what he was trying to teach me was that that I do I like I can choose to be the flower or I could choose to be the bee. And my sister hilariously with with things like this, like my grandmother, his mother once said to my sister, because I we have four older brothers and then my sister was born and my and my sister grandmother said to my sister, it was so nice when you were born. I thought someone to take care of the boys. And my sister said, you're thinking of someone else. <laughs> <laughs> did, but but it, did your dad, was your dad unintentionally like a gender equity role yes. model? That, yes. by, by, by treating you the same way he treats your brothers and not even using language or, 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 or situations or circumstances. That makes you feel, what, what does that, what does that it, make? It makes you feel more like a person. It makes you feel like more like, oh, I, 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 cause like the other thing is, is some people are like, I was, I have imposter syndrome. I don't think I'm good enough to do this thing or that thing, but I have a master's degree and I, I am also very tall and strong, but I don't think that I'm tall and strong and, and, and could do these things that I've clearly been overtrained for. Cause I have a, PhD and whatever. I was raised, the entire family raised to be imposters. Not imposter syndrome, but literally 
raised to have our own islands where we would be king. And he's like, why not? Do whatever, you know. And you're like, well, you stayed in South Milwaukee and paid for six children to become 18. Uh, you didn't do that. And he was like, had a good life, though. I pretty much did whatever I wanted within the purview of paying for, for raising us. I have a like a, a just a question. about He sounds the way you talk about him. And I think this is true of a lot of I sometimes feel this way about my dad who might be listening. So <clears throat> I, I try to be somewhat careful, although he everybody knows my dad. He comes on the podcast and stuff. But like, I don't think you'd mind me saying like, is, is that generation of men um, uh, more simplistic? There's like not as much nuance. Like the difference between me and my dad is like we have the, we we butt heads. I'm like, have you thought about this? And he'd be like, no, not really. <laughs> no, no, I haven't because nobody brought it up. Like for my dad, his task was to make sure that he literally was like, I have to make sure that there's enough food and, and, and shelter for these people. And then the rest of it, I yeah. get to get laid. I yeah. get to go out. I get to get a new car every year. I get to buy a pinky ring. Uh, you know, all of these things. But my when, thought, but but, yeah. but that's so traditional. I think, you know, and my thought, maybe you disagree, but my thought is that there's so much more to parenting than food and shelter. And I feel like a lot of dads, you know, take an easy way out where they go to work all day long. Right. And they then they complain about how much they work, but yep. they actually don't mind being away. Like, it's not nearly as hard as maybe being home with the kids all day or whatever, but but like there's so much in between that. And and for me, my dad, the best thing my dad did was he always spent time with us, like a ton of time. And so for what I, I mean, I spend so much time with the girls and I'm not sure like that. That's the what I think is a gray area that I'm talking about. It's it's so it's, much more than work. And and yeah, I don't think it's even a gray area. I think you're right. And the, and the thing that you lucked out with your dad is that that was something he wanted to do or that he was modeled or that someone told him that he needs to spend time with his kids yeah. Be, or he liked kids no, or he, he legit, liked you. He, 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 I'll just answer it real quick. He legit actually does like kids more yeah. than adults, I think. And more importantly, he definitely liked hanging out with us. Like I'm not being so complimentary because my dad does whatever he wants to do. Right. And he wanted to hang out with us, luckily. Right. And we wanted to hang out with him. There are, sep there are things that my dad are good at. Hanging out with us was not one of them. Right. Like uh, one of the other jokes from, uh, and this is, and I, and I reference my own act only because the stories are real, is that my father is a lot like radiation. We never <laughs> saw him when we were children, but he affected all of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> and he is like, but the thing is, is my stepmother. So my stepmother tried to make him hang out with us more when we were children. She was like, you're going to take each of these kids for a one on one breakfast. You like breakfast. You like to go to a, <laughs> a diner and have breakfast. But you're going to take them one at a time. Every Sunday, you're going to take a different kid to breakfast. Or Saturday, something like oh, that. Oh, wait. But hold on. The elephant in the room. I found this out. I did my prep. You lost your mom when you were six. Seven. Yeah. Seven. I yeah. think it was six. I looked it up. It was uh, my brothers would insist that I was eight. And, I think uh, it's how about wait, can I argue with you more about the age <laughs> at which you lost your mom? Because I uh, looked it up and um, I have, you were that's yeah. so you were seven years old and your mom. What, do you talk about that? I do. I the, the uh, here's the thing. She was so young and she did not have a huge support system and she could not have been more fucking fertile. Right. She just kept having babies and. So she had me when she was 26. And so she had six children under the age of 10. And that's insane. And my dad was like, you know, he's in the Navy. He's now he's working. Um, not, now he's selling uh, everything he can to make money. And he's giving her money. And he's and so she so she when they finally split up um, was in 69. So I would have been four. The last three years of her life, she literally partied like she was 19. She was trying to catch up. Right. right. And because and there were no witnesses. Right. There was just a pile of children. And uh, and my oldest brother, who was like 14, going, we get to party now. I'll uh, uh, see you later. I got to go. And uh, so. <laughs> wow. 
Yeah. So it was, yeah, it, she did, according to my oldest brothers, she did her best. She tried her damnedest to do the June Cleaver thing for like the first five or six years. And then she just got, I think she got worn out. So she was like, screw it. I'm going to try to figure something else out. And, uh, and so I have, and this is, this is a sad thing to say out loud, but I don't have any positive memories of my mother. Yeah, it's a bummer. Because, uh, and, but I, here's the, here's the thing. I've worked my way through it and I don't, I know that that's, I know that there's no possible way that that can be true. Right. That she wasn't a good person to me, you know, most of the time. Right. Or she didn't, she wasn't a good person with them most of the time. So whatever. I don't know. I feel like, I feel like parenting is a lot about not knowing anything. And not like, you know, you live what you learn. So if you, whatever you learned, like if, if you had a parent who was around and was loving and spent time with you, then you, there's like no manual. There's, there's no, it's just you only, you, you, I mean, to the point where we sometimes get so wrapped up and I'm sure it's different now with my kids, but like you think that your job, the only job for you is the one your dad did. Like what? Like you're so emulating them and not even knowing, you don't even know just to be so, like, maybe she had no idea what she was doing, which would be completely, like, innocent. But that's super plausible and completely innocent. And there's no reason. I mean, when you think about, like, the hitting, because she was a big, she was relatively violent. And um, it then, you know, like, you know, you're not supposed to be violent. You, I mean, though, I'll tell you this. I've had to figure out. Like when I figured out that I was the adult, I used to do childcare for a long time. Plus I have 15 nieces and nephews, right? So um, when I realized that I was the adult in a situation, it kind of blew my mind. <laughs> like I had to take three months off of, of babysitting, of childcare, of doing babysitting. Or I, don't, I forget, I know it was over a, a month, a month and a half. Um, while I was like, made peace with the fact that in a situation where there is a nine-year-old who was a jackass. I'm the only adult in the room. And so my responsibility is to be the adult. They get to be a child. I, I disagree. Really? I think you're not, I think you're not giving your mom enough credit or, or you're, and you're giving yourself or not enough credit and you're giving your mom too much credit maybe in that when it comes to hitting, now you've got me defending violence. So like, <laughs> It's well, the same thing. You learn what you live. And when you said you said flippantly, like, you know, you're not supposed to hate your kids. And I, I immediately thought, I don't think people do know that because it works a lot to get them to change their behavior in the short term. What it doesn't do is build build a great relationship or set you up for, a, you know, but like people's yeah. arguments about it. But there's still arguments about corporal punishment. I mean, it's li Jackie, it's legal. Do you know how many states like in schools they can paddle their kids? The point being. I think you're you're not giving you know enough credit there. I'm like that a lot of people I don't fight it. Yeah, they don't know. They think it it does work to a certain extent to get a kid to stop doing something. Right. Um. And you could argue it does work, but well, they're not going to run out in the street again. Yeah, but they're fucking limping and they hate you now. Like there's. Yeah, I don't know. Well, and I think as soon as I said it, I was like, <clears throat> I was reminded of when I learned because I. I didn't know. There that. you go. Yeah, exactly. Was, yeah. Some, so, there was some intervention in your life that said, oh, no, no, actually, it's not good. Right. It's so, but it, but up until that point, I was like, well, that's how, because there was, there was a lot of hitting. And then my, my mother died and my father remarried and my stepmother, there had been little or no hitting. So she was like, there's not, what, well, why are people hitting each other? There should be no hitting. <laughs> Stop hitting each other. <laughs> Nancy Cation. No. No, I know it is, it is. It is. The more enlightened, I, uh, forgive me for being so uh, erudite, the more enlightened <laughs> you, you become as like a parent, the more bizarre violence becomes. And even as a man, like uh, I, I think about I have a lot of anger issues and stuff and I think about violence all the time. But when I think about it deep and long in a calm moment, I, I start to laugh about how silly it is to like the, the best thing you can do in a fight. I will. I, I believe to this day is run. Yes. Or oh if you if you break into my house, I always say this, but with these gun people and their you know self defense, if you break into my house, I would be like, hey, hi, um, please don't hurt my family. Take whatever you want. 
I'm not I'm not gonna fight you. You can take whatever you want. Just don't yeah. hurt my family. I'm not right. trying to fight you. I'm not gonna go get my gun because you might fucking shoot me or my kid. Like, I don't wanna fight. Just take yeah. what you need. Right. Don't set us on fire. Clearly you care more about this than I do. Yeah. You brought a gun to a not gun fight. You I'd win. show him where I'd be like, uh, here's our cash. Like, please here's, just if don't yeah. hurt like I don't what know. Do you, it, what do you need? Do you also I've literally had the same thing where I'm just like, uh, if I'm being, if I'm, I was mugged once and I was like, God, I wish I could have just talked to him and said, can I keep my ID? It's such a pain in the neck to get a new ID. Can you just empty the wallet and take what you, the credit cards, if you think you can get gas or whatever, but can I keep my ID? Is it true that that guy who stole your shit then saw your act and gave it back to you? <laughs> no. What? That would be so funny. <laughs> It's, I just I was trying to think of the most insulting thing I could do right that moment. <laughs> You're like, what? Why would he do that? No, because he just it was. Oh. He was not impressed after he robbed you and then saw exactly. you at the club that night. Right. He was like, I could have got comped. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> this is the lady I robbed. Um, your your views on on uh, on like if you do a great job in this late latest album. Talking about again, going back to these issues, which I this is where I where I had this thought uh, about gender and sexuality, and and I guess specifically you you use those words and you kind of explain the difference in a hilarious way to us. And I thought maybe we could just talk like about how you arrive at those opinions, which again I'm saying they're not that offensive. I think there's going to be a lot of guys that normally would be if you, if I if you talked about it just slightly different, they'd be like what and be yeah. triggered and and get mad. But it's not you really kind of. You're not saying, oh, women are better or men are better. You're like, this. we're all, listen, we're all. And then it comes yeah. to sex and gender. And I, I don't know what that question I'm asking. I just want to get you talking about it. Well, it's interesting about that, that bit because it's still growing because I'm still learning. Right. Sure. And um, and the gender thing, you know, I, it, there's a point where I, I talk about how I mean, here's where it's kind of uh, where I'm at right now, which is, well, OK, first I'll say the gender and sexuality bit took about three years to write. And I would do the bit and um, youth, youngers, youngins would come up and say, your heart's in the right place. You're slightly off. And I was like, all right, what, what am I doing wrong? What are you hearing when I'm saying the thing? And they're like, I'm hearing your voice and I'm hearing your intent. But the way you're putting it is a little too judgmental. It's a little too. And I was like, I'm still doing this joke because the thing is, is it's me trying to figure out. Because I, at, at a certain point, it's just, I'm jealous. I'm jealous that they came up with it. They're, this generation has come up with this definition of gender, and I see what they're doing. They're using it as a way to go. Because remember when you grew up, and you're like 10 or 11, or your whole life, somebody says, well, you're a boy. You're a boy, and this is how you're supposed to be, and this is the things you're supposed to want. And you're like, okay, all right. And then you start having sexual feelings. And if they're homosexual feelings and you're a boy, you're like, does this mean I'm a girl? Because now, you know, I'm not respected and I guess I'm just a whole. I'm guess uh, so I'm a, am I a girl in all things then? And you're like, no, no. Cause the thing, cause there's a certain point where you're like, can I just have sexual feelings? And st do I still get to be me? I remember this. Do I still get to be me and a girl? They felt like two separate things at, at a point, right? Where I was like, I'm just, because most of the time I'm just me. And then sometimes I'm like, well, I get to look how cute that those shoes are or that dress is. I get to wear that because I'm a girl. And a boy doesn't get to wear those because he's a boy. And so that's where it all came from. It came from this place of like, I'm just me. And they've, figured out a way to go just call me a they them and then if i ever want to have sex with you we'll have a conversation because i just want to be a person first yeah you do such a great job with that bit it is a it's an award-winning bit to know that you've been working on it for that long and more importantly that young people whoever they were heroes and and you <laughs> being a hero too it's hard as a comedian much as a person to be told hey tweak this maybe you could present this differently but if you're if you're comfortable and confident, you can hear that, and that's why it gets better. And what an amazing uh, evolution for that bit to talk to young people and to talk about how th how they're hearing it versus yeah. what your intention, of course, is. 
it's wonderful. And, 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 and I think it illustrates exactly you all. You go on in, in your act and talk about kind of the the movement with in our business or in, in the world. But specifically, you talk about entertainment with sexual assault. And you have this kind of observation where at some point you're in a conversation and you're telling a younger person about what happened yeah. uh, when you're and they, and they basically are shocked and they're like, you allowed that you that happened. Right. You didn't do this or that because the world has changed so much that you are almost like kind of embarrassed or humiliated that you didn't that, that our generation wasn't better or wasn't more uh, aware of the shit so that you didn't have to go through or that you had to deal with so much of it. Right. I, I can't tell you more than two people who are in their 20s and 30s have said, that's actually rape. That's actually sexual assault. <laughs> that's mm. actually harassment. And I was like, no, it's just stand up. Stand up. Sometimes it's it's gross. I don't know if you. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's not <laughs> that's. Seriously. You're talking you're talking about a- I'm sorry just to be clear for everybody. You're talking about when someone does a joke or tells a story on stage, they don't realize they're describing a crime or you're talking about a behavior off stage and off, they don't realize. Well, off stage when I the the uh well both obviously, but I mean but when I would tell the younger comics something that had happened. Right. Oh, got it. I, yeah. I, they'd be like that's actually harassment. You and I was like, "Well, there's no HR. Who am I going right. to tell that to?" Yeah. And I want to work that weird club in the middle of Illinois again. And uh, so how do I, how do I not, you know, how do I both confront the guy and get to work there again? Yeah. Right. There was a guy in Milwaukee who uh, owned a club on Brady street. He would pay everybody with a gun on the table pointed at you. And he would always underpay you. Or from what I've heard is here's what I know. I was featuring, so I'm making three hundred dollars for five shows. Uh, I believe that's still the going rate. Club owners, pick it yeah. up anyway. Yeah. So uh, I go in to get paid on Saturday night after the show. The gun is sitting there on the on the table. He's like, "Have a seat." And so I sit down, and I'm like, and then um, and then he hands me my stack of twenties, and it's supposed to be three hundred dollars, right? It's two hundred twenty five dollars. And I look at him, I was like, it's supposed to be $300. It's short. And he goes, yeah, you think you're worth $300? You think what you did there was worth $300? And my stomach is in, you know, is in the floor and I'm, my head's lightheaded. And I just go, doesn't matter. You said you would give me $300. And he goes, all right. And he hands me $75 and he never books me again. And I don't and I and all I could do is second guess myself. Was I supposed to eat it? Was I supposed to not say something? Uh, do I have the pride of at least standing up for myself? You know, and I'm like, yeah, but you don't have the stage time in your hometown. You're like Christ and your miracles don't work in Milwaukee. So <laughs> you're like, what is happening? So. Oh, that's brutal. That's brutal, brutal, brutal. That's a tough. But it's also. So, I mean, I'm sure you've got other stories like that. And, and, and you know, I think comedy, especially, I, I love that you said I've been saying this, too, for years to young comics. There's no HR department. There's also no union for comedians. There's right. no protections and club owners. And now what's happening, too, is a lot of club owners, I think, I don't know if you think this, uh, you would know more than me, but are have always been conservative Republicans, be, you know, because they're business for whatever reason. That's not I'm not even being pejorative. But but, but that what that means is then they have these uh, they become radicalized with a lot of other people with views and they're not booking any, you know, comedians uh, who who are liberals increasingly. And I'm, I'm wondering well, if if that's a thing, because so many club owners are Republican Trump asshole guys that that and now that you didn't used to be the case because we weren't all everything's political, though. So I'm wondering your your thoughts on it. Well, the weird thing about the Republican Party is like, I know Republicans. The Republican Party right now isn't full of Republicans. It's full of, I mean, and I'm not even exaggerating, treasonous, traitorous, terrorist. Like the GOP is not the second party anymore. I don't know what is, but uh, it's not those because the Republicans I know are either socially conservative or fiscally conservative or um and they just the don't want to pay. T- they, they don't want. They have. They have um, 
arguments and ideas on taxes and paying people in business. And it's like, I disagree with them. I think it's bullshit, but whatever. Go ahead. But they're not like my brother. One of my brothers has a lifelong Republican, has not voted Republican in a long time. Considers himself a lifelong Republican. I was like, well, you're an incredibly bad Republican and I love you for it (laughs) and uh, because he's just he has a sense of, you know, community and he has a sense of justice. And he has and and when he has seen I was just telling this, I've been on many podcasts, so I'm sorry if you've heard the story already, but it's my favorite story. He teaches middle school. He's an econ professor and um, and an investor and he has grown sons now, but when they were in middle school, he taught, he was assistant coach for football and he fell in love with it, with coaching. And uh, so he still teaches, he still coaches middle school football. And so there's a game and this happened probably eight, six weeks ago, a month, two months ago. The kids are out of the field. uh, It's during the game. One of his kids comes in and, um, and my brother's like, what, what's, well, What's happening? Why aren't you? And he goes, the kid across the way called me the N word. And it was one of the, one of the black kids on his team, obviously. Right. So, uh, and the kid goes, the the other kid, they're 12. And and he goes, the kid called me the N word. What should I do? And my brother goes, punch him. You don't, you're not Jackie Robinson. You're not being paid to take this. You're 12. You get to punch people. It doesn't last for long. And he goes, really? And I said, he goes, yeah. And then the kid's father, because is 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 uh, is in the stands. He doesn't get to see a lot of games, I guess. But he was in the stands, and he's an Air Force officer. And he calls him down from the stands. He sends the kid back out, and the and the dad is like, "What's going on?" And all of a sudden, there's a big scrum out on the field, and uh, my brother turns to the dad, and goes, uh, "Somebody just called your kid the N word." And uh, and the dad's like, "What?" And uh, so I don't know if there was another way to deal with that, but. The ref who heard the kid call the other kid the name and gave the kid, my brother's kid, the team kid, um, a 15-yard penalty for sportsmanship, for fighting, and uh, penalized the whole team another 15 yards for, for fighting. And so after the game, my brother lines up the team on the side of the, and he won't let him shake the other team's hand. And so the head ref comes over and says, you have to, you, you can't, I'm going to kick you out of the league for unsportsmanlike behavior. And my brother goes, you're going to fire that ref or we're going to find another league should take about 11 minutes. And supposedly they fire the guy, though I opinion is that they just Catholic church, the guy, right. Uh, And, but the, the transported um, him to another league. Yeah, they just moved him to different games. And but uh so a they wider, go, a wide a wider league. <laughs> so they go into the into, into the locker room and my brother's talking to the team and he goes, "How many of you uh, you guys heard what was said to our kid?" And a couple of the other kids raise their hand. And he goes, "Nope. You have to support your teammates on the field, off the field. That's not okay what he did, obviously. So you when that happens, You pile on the bad guy, pile on the bad guy. And I was like, I love my brother for standing up for it for, and he's a button pusher. So I'm sure he enjoyed every moment of it, but uh, (laughs) it is, you know, he uses his powers for good to some extent. Right. I mean, if you think telling a 12 year old kid to punch another kid is good, (laughs) some some people, some people might not recommend that. I would go with what the, the air force father Whatever the kid's father, who's in the Air Force, maybe however he wanted to to handle it. But I oh, no. love that. I I love that story because that's that's there's any number of ways that you can take a thing. But more importantly, I feel like we're talking more about in politics. It's more about like your character and 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 the type of person you are. And going back to the club owner who didn't want to pay you, like there's a thing that has nothing to do with liberal or conservative in my mind, but had to do with kind of being an honorable person. And if you hire someone to do your, build you a deck and they build it, but it's not perfect or something, you still got to pay them yeah. and hopefully you can work something out. But if you hire someone to do comedy, unless they shot the audience or, or attack like you pay them no matter what because you made a deal. And so right. it's a matter of character, not politics and, and not even ideology. It's like, do, do you think it's OK to call people names 
No. Yes. Sir. I thought we agreed on these things. Do you think it's OK I, to not pay someone for a service they did? Because I didn't realize that we were divided down political lines over that. I thought you're supposed to pay someone or 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 if not, take legal action or whatever. But you don't. It's it's a it's a it's a power play is what it is. It's yeah, what yeah, it power. always is. And with club owners, they do it to men as well as women. Oh, yeah. But but the, I got uh, stories for sure. Like you, you're you just like, are you kidding me? And I have I, stories, by the way, I, I, my, and we don't hear enough about this because of the, I suppose it's kind of controversial, but like I was sexually harassed at least three or four times by male club, club owners or bookers. It wasn't, it didn't destroy my life or my career. And it was a few times, but they were men. And, and I guess people don't talk about it as much because you don't want to go, like, go after gay people. These guys were all openly gay guys. And, you know, I mean, comedians and book, I mean, it, it happens uh, and, and people don't talk about that, but it is, there's no one to, what do you do? I mean, what do you do in that situation? You need the, uh, you need the you gig. Live you, you live defensively yeah. and uh, you don't, you don't be alone. You don't be alone with people that are, that are gross. And, you know, I worked three summers in Provincetown, Massachusetts at a hot dog stand, uh, and which is a big gay resort, Provincetown, Massachusetts. Cape Cod. And, uh, and what I like to say when people would buy a foot long hot dog is put a condiment on that. I got a lot of jokes that don't make it to the stage. And uh, but I do love brightening a day anyway. So but there were two kids who had grown up in P-Town and they hated gay men. They didn't hate the good ones. And they literally talked like that. And they were 15, 14 or 15 years old. But they got harassed to and from by drunk dudes. And they were like, got to live defensively. And I was like, welcome to my world. Yes. I mean, but it's but just to be clear what we're saying, and unfortunately, and maybe you have a great way out of out of this conversation (laughs) where nobody gets hurt. But we're talking about men behaving badly, not gay men or not straight men. We're talking about men. But I think you're also talking about power, in which case, obviously, you could talk for a long time about women, powerful women in in our business or in your life. But it's there. There's still a difference. And I feel like that's where we start talking about, like, sexuality and, 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 and how that is maybe different in our world. I don't know. But I don't I don't all I know is I remember in the 70s, um, there was this big thing where they defined rape as not a sexual crime, but a violent crime. And because it it involves, you know, tab A, slot B or tab A or slot A. I mean, because there's because there's there's penetration and sex parts are, are used. They've always treated, you know, there's always been this talk that it's a sex crime. When in fact it is a violent power crime, right? It's a it's a it's an abuse of power, and it's violent because you're holding someone down and you're saying horrible things and or doing horrible things. Anyway, but the but the but you are right. The point is is that people abuse power, and whether they're straight men or gay men or women, or you know any everyone. You have to be taught not to abuse power to use, you know, like you'll meet a really, have you ever met like, and you have a giant dude who doesn't know his own strength, right? And we say that you don't know your own strength when they're kids, right? You yeah. meet like a, a kid that is five, two, and then the next year he's six, three. And you're like, Hey man, uh, you're actually much stronger than you were a year and a half ago. You've, you know, you also are a little tippy. Uh, cause you're, you're on, <laughs> cause you don't know how, <laughs> how to use your feet. And, uh, but the thing is, <laughs> is when, if, if you are raised correctly, or if you have the wherewithal in your brain, you learn your own power in stand up comedy. I have to lose, use the power of my mouth, right? I will sometimes say things where I'm like, I don't know my own power. Cause I'm so used to hanging out with comics and I'm so used to ripping yeah, and yeah, I'm so used yeah. to, yep. there's all these things where you're like, don't say that. That is a normal yeah. lady trying to live her goddamn life. I am. so You just liberated me because I've always I feel like I have really have that problem. My wife's talked to me about it. Everybody's talked to me about it. I'm like <laughs> just because you're quick witted and whatever doesn't mean you can unleash it. That's mean and wrong. And that's where I just never heard it described as as like it being a power that you have the way that you just did. I thought that that was really interesting. Do you? I, we, it's been an hour. You have eight other podcasts, but I did want to ask you one more question about vaccines. Oh, yeah. What about Do you have time? boosted? Yeah, yeah, I'm boosted. No, not Go about ahead. vaccines, but about like just this kind of moral, maybe moral conflict. Maybe you don't struggle with it. But like I'm thinking about going we have booking a bunch of dates and I'm thinking about like 
what role do I play in bringing people out into a room and potentially getting sick? Should I um, only work at clubs that have these rules with vaccines or, or masks or anything? Do, are you struggling with that at all? Is that a thing you, you, you require or think about? I think about it just because I work with like Maria Bamford and Brian Regan and I do a podcast with Lori Kilmartin and we've talked about it. We've talked about it incessantly. And the thing is, is I can't, uh, these other people running these businesses, I just did Florida. I don't know if you know this. Uh, I was at the hard rock cafe, uh, in with the seminal casino in Hollywood, I Florida. There. That's a great, it was at least years ago. That's where we conceived our daughter. Uh, in a, in a building shaped like a guitar. No, that's in six- the hotel, in the hotel that went with it. Yeah. That's where it, it, that is also a hotel now. That's where I Maybe stayed. Maybe I'm thinking of the wrong club, but I just wanted to uh, crowbar in that I conceived my daughter at an improv in Florida. <laughs> and, uh, and it sticks out of the swamps like the devil's thumb. <laughs> and uh, let me tell you something. There's no, nobody in Florida, there's so few mask wearing, you know, nobody wants to hear about your, your, um, like I, I gently made fun of them. Um, but it was, here's, here's what I can do in these situations is I can wear a mask and if anybody gives me any guff, I can say, I haven't had a cold in two years. Why don't you get off my areola? Uh, Janelle Monet. And so, uh, but the, uh, I can also, um, not sell merch. Like I've decided to not be arbiter of that. Cause I also don't have the power to say you have to have a, but when I post like next week, I'm doing Milwaukee. And they're spiking all over the place, Wisconsin is, because they're uh, full of dum-dums and, and the gullible. And, uh, and one of those things you could fix, by the way, my fellow Wisconsinites, stop being so gullible. So, um, but I, when I post things, I'm like, be vaccinated, wear masks, come and see me. If you're not vaccinated, I don't want to be part of your death. Right, right. I, some variation on that I have said. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have a judgment either way. I think the best thing you can do is is communicate to be, to to your audience who might buy tickets. This is what I expect, this, but but you have to make we have to make a living. And because the vaccine is available, you have a choice. And I went, you know, my wife and I went to a Broadway show on Saturday night, and it was filled shoulder to shoulder, and you had to wear a mask. And I wasn't comfortable. I didn't like going. My wife wanted to go, and I went along. But but like you know, I didn't I, I didn't love that. But you, they're giving you. At this point in time, a choice. And by the way, you have to be vaccinated. I didn't even mention that has show that on the way in. So everybody there, at least if you get sick, you're far less likely to die if you're vaccinated. Yeah. And and I feel like we're at a point and I feel like people don't change their opinions with time that you can with the vaccine. You can be clear. And, and I think morally you're on the right side of it, I think. But I yeah. just want to know what your thoughts and, were. Right. Because you got to work. I completely yeah. agree that I have to. This is what I do for a living. And when anybody says well, I can't believe you're compromised. You're going to go to that place that doesn't require vaccinations or you'll work for that guy. And I'm like, well, did you go to work today? Right. What do you right. do for a living? Do you work for, I'm sorry, Gandhi? And uh, <laughs> who do you work for? And uh, I, can't, I can't, I want to live indoors. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big, it's a big thing that I love. Being <laughs> indoors. <laughs> Jackie, I'll let you old. go. And Thanks, I know I, I just uh, I've been a fan a long time and we've crossed paths, but never like I'm so glad to finally have a conversation like this with you because yeah. I was um, I was kind of intimidated. I called uh, Lori Kilmartin ahead of time. I was like, anything I should know about Jackie? Like, I don't know her well enough. And she's like, yeah, oh pronounce, God, her, pronounce she- her, pronounce her name correctly. And uh, <laughs> that's, thank you, Jackie. I really appreciate it. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Jackie Cation, everybody. Check her out on Twitter. See her live if she's in your town. And go buy her album right now. Check out her podcasts as well. So good. So happy to have her joining me. All right. And now it's time to get to my second guest on today's show. She is a brilliant political science professor who specializes in U.S. law, public policy, health policy, currently at Oberlin in Ohio. She's written for The New York Times, The Washington Post, and The Guardian. She's got her Ph.D. from 
Columbia. She's a huge fan of Springsteen and Yankees baseball. And she's awesome on Twitter at Miranda Yaver. And she's just announced publicly that she is going to be moving to Massachusetts and uh, got a tenured job at Wheaton College, which is very exciting. I had a great conversation with her about several different things, and it is time to press play on that. All right. Well, I'm very excited to have a Dr. Miranda Yaver. Wait, did I say your name wrong again? No, you said it correctly. Oh, my God. I just got a ping of like fears. Like, wait a second. Back <laughs> on the show because I'm mostly You're like one of the few to get it right. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm very happy to have you back on the show and I'm very happy to, to just celebrate uh, on the record now. Your, your great news. You have been offered a position at Wheaton College or is it university in Massachusetts? Wheaton College in Massachusetts, yep, tenure track assistant professor. Okay, explain to someone who didn't go to college or doesn't know about how college works why this is a great situation for you or probably anyone in your world. Um, it just means job security for, for the next um, several years. Uh, I've been in a visiting position at Oberlin, and it's been a great place to teach, but you know, it's a one-year contract. And so being able to be planted, being able to to focus a lot on, on research and teaching someplace where... Uh, yeah, uh, where I'm rewarded with a, with a longer contract, hopefully, ultimately getting tenure and then having job security, you know, moving forward uh, is a real relief uh, and, you know, a comfort, you know, in, in terms of pursuing research and teaching. You mentioned research twice, and I'm interested in, in what that means for a scholar of that does what you do and, and why that's a great thing. Like, I love doing research, but it's to prepare usually to interview somebody or about it to be to, to understand an issue. You're doing it like professionally. As a scholar, what is the what are you what kind of research are you doing and why do you like it? So I just over the pandemic, I conducted a nationwide survey on health insurance claim denials and looking at the ways in which this insurance practice deepens health and economic inequality in the United States. So we know that so many of your listeners have probably experienced a claim denial at some point in time. About a third of the people in my survey experienced a claim denial at some point, and most of those people experienced multiple claim denials. And so thinking about who is, who is most vulnerable to this insurance practice, who appeals denied claims and does so successfully, and how does this reshape the way in which we interact with our health insurance system? So do we become less likely to go to the doctor because we're concerned that the claim that we're going to deal with another claim denial and sort of have to to deal with the administrative burdens associated with uh, with the appeals process, which is arduous. It's a pain in the ass, and um, and a lot of people don't want to deal with it. And, and insurance companies often expect us to give up and pay up. Can I just ask you, like, instead of going into the details about that, which we could, I'm interested in and who, who ends up paying and who gets targeted and incentives and so on. My the question I really want to know is like, what happens in Canada or the UK? or Australia or France or Japan or Israel. Like, I'm sure their systems aren't perfect. I'm sure there are problems. But when I think about how daunting it is to navigate a claim and how that discourages you maybe from even going to the doctor and about how much time it might take you, and then specifically the kind of stress that that creates and how mm -hmm. it, 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 it hurts your productivity in other areas of your life. Like these other countries, is it, I don't know how much you've studied them, but I'm, I'm guessing it's not the kind of nightmare that navigating our system for a, a claim is. So I haven't studied comparatively. I, I only look within the United States. But I think that, you know, given the nature of health insurance companies in the United States, I think that this is a problem that I don't I don't know that it's unique to the to the United States. But I think that the severity of it is probably uh, unique. We have you know, a very profit motivated insurance um, system you know, uh, for-profit companies, and um, they're going to be protecting their bottom line when, they, when they're deciding what to cover and what not to cover. So just give me one, like, scenario or something that you've learned from this research about those who are most vulnerable. When I lost just a quick, quick anecdote to talk about my wife and I, we're, we're white, middle, upper class. She's educated with a, a master's degree, almost. She's, like, three credits from it. Uh, I'm, uh, I've got an associate's degree. We're both really smart, I think, and she at least is really organized. And yet, when I lost my corporate gig, trying to get health insurance for our family was, and I didn't mention about her, she's really tough and resilient. And she broke down like twice. And I remember like through tears and emotion, she said at one point, she goes, I can't imagine 
what it must be like for someone who doesn't speak good English. Like that's what she yeah. focused on because just having to communicate at a certain level, know what questions to ask, the correspondence, the technology that you might require you to, I don't know, do anything from making a PDF. Like that was our situation and that's yeah. us. So th- that's why I, I lay that out for you to pick up the ball and tell me about how a lot of, you know, a lot of other people deal with it based on your research. Yeah, I mean, that was something that that really inspired me to deal with this, to deal with this project, because I'd experienced a claim denial myself. And fortunately, or I should say for better and worse, I've got a lot of experience navigating the American healthcare system. And I wrote up a very detailed law, um, detailed letter, you know, highlighting my understanding of of medicine and and my insurance plan and and all of this, but, you know, it demands a lot of medical literacy. And because I have decent Twitter following, I tweeted out my appeal letter and they immediately reversed it. But most people don't have those resources. Oh, that's great. That is great. What did you do? You you shared publicly the situation which gave uh, readers on the insurance company and, and tagged the insurance company and and that that got them to reverse the decision immediately because they don't like that PR. You used your fame. <laughs> I, I try. And but, you know, a lot of people aren't going to think to do that. A lot of people don't have the resources to do that. Right. A lot of, you know, the people who who are you know less likely to appeal denied claims and therefore likely to essentially have health insurance on coverage on paper, but not in practice is not having access to their health benefits are disproportionately lower socioeconomic status, um, which is what we would expect. Education has somewhat of an influence, but it's really um, income. And, you know, I also found some other vulnerabilities. So like the LGBT respondents were more likely than their counterparts to experience claim denials in the first place. People who had worse, who were in worse health were also less likely to uh, to appeal denied claims. So I think that there was probably some mm-hmm. sort of defeatism. I don't know what the exact mechanism was. But one of the one of the really striking things was that about 40 percent of people postpone medical care in the in response to these claim denials. And there's a you know, there's a real concern that people who are postponing care could potentially be getting sicker. And that this is really going to to have adverse not just economic impact but also uh, but also uh, health. I bet you like most people listening, even if they're affluent and highly educated, have some some contact with health insurance claim that's a nightmare, whether it be them or their loved one, someone that they're looking out for. And so it's a really very important issue. I want to, when I get to talk to you, I want to ask about a bunch of separate issues. So uh, ladies and gentlemen and and Miranda, forgive the hard pivots without segues, (laughs) but I will try to do a segue on this one because I think that your expertise based on health policy and the constitution uh, can inform a kind of ethical uh, opinion, at least decision on on the idea of, you know, what's going on right now with covid and with mandates and the Supreme Court yesterday decided that New York state could uphold its uh, vaccine mandate for New York employees. Am I getting it right off Mm -hmm. the top of my head? Yeah. So you have to be vaccinated to work at certain New York state facilities, government uh, places. And uh, that's my belief. Yeah. And and they decided, I think, like six, three on that. And, you know, just in general, like what is the constitution uh, issuing a blistering dissent? Yeah. Yeah. Do you, what can you tell us about how how you see that case constitutionally and w- what was Gorsuch? What did he what was he so upset about? Uh, yeah. So it's it's not t- I, I guess I'm not terribly surprised because. Even though this is a staunchly conservative court, uh, dealing with issues of public health and safety falls within what's referred to as the state's police powers. That is the state's ability to to regulate public health, safety, welfare and morals of of their citizens. And so, you know, vaccine mandates would seem to fall within that scope. And there is a 1905 case, I believe it's 1905, case called Jacobson versus Massachusetts, uh, which affirms the legality of, of state vaccine uh, mandates and so so this you know it's, it's certainly consistent i i think it would be a very different it will be it would be a very different story if it were a federal mandate as opposed to a state one but but the uh, new york appeared to be on solid ground on this oh really it, that's in, that's an interesting point so it's a state's rights thing and, and conservatives might be good to not challenge such a 
a mandate for fear of it being used against them in issues they care about. Also, wasn't there what was Gorsuch's upset about? And wasn't there some like everybody's making a point about religious exemptions <laughs> and, and how they they didn't allow for them. But <laughs> but uh, if it were Muslim or, or something, it's, people were talking about the Muslim ban or something and, and, and to, to yeah. prove a contradiction. But I forget what it was. And I'm muddling through this to try to get you to tell me right. what I'm talking about. So, so I've been teaching all week, so I, I haven't I haven't had the chance to read uh, to read the full the full opinion. But but there there are always going to be uh, concerns whenever there aren't religious exemptions because um, because of issues with respect to the free exercise clause and and, you know, people's ability to to say that that we you know man, that mandatory vaccines contradict their religious beliefs. Um, but this but obviously, you know, when we're talking about a deadly pandemic, there there are certain uh, limitations that are probably going to be permissible. All right. So what about this uh, Gavin Newsom response to the Texas law? <laughs> where he tweeted, SCOTUS is letting private citizens in Texas sue to stop abortion. If that's the precedent, then we'll let Californians sue those who put ghost guns and assault weapons on our streets. If Texas can ban abortion and endanger lives, California can ban deadly weapons of war and save lives. And you quote tweeted this with a very thoughtful uh, <laughs> academic response. That, it confused me because you're a con lawyer and a scholar and a uh, con law scholar. And you wrote, uh, let's see, fuck yes. <laughs> yeah, that was that was my eloquent response to to Gavin Newsom. Is it a real, yeah, is it a mean, real strategy? Is it a real like? Is this going to backfire on the on on the conservatives who you know care about abortion and guns? So I don't think it's going to backfire on conservatives because I think that the Supreme Court is not going to be ideologically consistent when they're looking at a gun control issue versus an abortion issue. I I do not think that ideological consistency is something to which this the Supreme Court is attached. Um, I think that they are much more attached to. Uh, I mean, in terms of in terms of and uh, in, in terms of legal rationales, I think they're much more uh, attached to conservative outcomes. Um, but this is this is something that the Supreme Court made itself very vulnerable to in in not striking down SB eight uh, Texas's uh, anti abortion law. Uh, they they have allowed Texas's SB eight to remain in effect, um, and and this is obviously a very extreme law allowing people to sue to prevent abortions or people to so, suing so people who aid in abetting and aid in abetting an abortion. And and so by by allowing this law to remain in effect, they've they've certainly made themselves vulnerable to to these kinds of you know liberal sort of models of of this of this enforcement policy. I don't think it's a great policy, um, but uh, but I think it's nice to be able. It, I, I'm encouraged when I see that that Democrats are at least trying innovative policies to to fight back against the conservative extremism, uh, because we're obviously seeing very extreme policy being put forward and on the right. Right. Yeah. Uh, what do you make of, I mean, what are your, what's your view on the future of women's reproductive rights? I know it's a huge question, but I mean, obviously yeah. you're a con law scholar. Everybody's got a point of view on how the Supreme Court is going to decide this. And in June, do you, do you, uh, how do you feel about making predictions about the court's decision based on hearing the arguments? So the argument did not go well in Dobbs versus Jackson. Um, <laughs> Uh, the uh, it overlapped perfectly with my constitutional law class, and so I played uh, the first hour of the oral argument Ooh. in my comp class, which was I mean it was fun, it was dismal, but it was it was good to be able to do that. Yeah, you know I there are two different ways that the Supreme Court could come down. One of them is to out um, outright overturn Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. The other thing that they can do is roll back what constitutes an undue burden within the meaning of Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Because in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, for those who don't know, the Supreme Court said that, that Roe versus Wade was affirmed, but the states could enact their own restrictions as long as they didn't constitute an undue burden in the path of the woman. And so one thing that they can do is narrow what constitutes an undue burden and essentially say, we're going to keep Roe in place technically, but this doesn't look like an undue burden and that doesn't look like an undue burden. And that's not so much an undue burden, essentially rendering the concept meaningless without technically overruling either precedent. And so, you know, I think Roberts would definitely prefer that approach because right. he, he's not in favor of Roe versus Wade, but he's also sort of concerned about institutional legacy. And, you know, the... Considering how willing Justice Kavanaugh felt 
the CC seemed to to overturn precedent in the or in the oral argument. He was talking about all these precedents that have been overturned. Yeah. Um, I don't think that it's a stretch to say that the Supreme Court will overturn Roe versus Wade. Um, but it's altogether possible that they took that they take the um the approach of just uh, grossly narrowing on Burton. I've been asking uh, uh, everybody this question who certainly has your background from politics to uh, con law issues and where they meet, what you think the reaction politically on the left will would be if if the harshest decision and is interpreted that Roe v. Wade has been been overturned. Do you think what do you think happens as as a result politically? So there it, in my view, I actually think that it's probably better for Democratic mobilization if Roe versus Wade gets overturned rather than this this significant narrowing of, of undue burden. Because I think that if if the Supreme Court technically doesn't overturn Roe versus Wade, but allows pre-viability abortion bans to be in effect and really makes it difficult to say that anything is an undue burden, it's hard to say that that abortion rights are really intact, but it's hard to also run on on the grave decisions that the Supreme Court is making. I think that people can understand, wrap their heads around the idea of Roe versus Wade being overturned. So there is the Women's Health Protection Act that has been introduced in Congress. I don't think it's going to pass there. That would codify codify Roe v. Wade, whatever that means. It would make the the law of the land that that the Supreme Court couldn't uh, overturn the legislative branch. So basically what what Congress can do is they can say they can assert they can they can make it the law of the land. They can assert it under the Commerce Clause if they want to. I've perused the the Women's Health Protection Act and the phrase interstate commerce comes up a few times that they're really making that connection. So the Supreme Court has said that has said that to to for Congress to regulate something under the Interstate Commerce Clause, there has to be a substantial effect on interstate commerce. There ha- it has to be an economic activity that would through repetition elsewhere and have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. And it can't be just an, in, in the, and the Congress, may, the court made a, a distinction between activity and inactivity and, and National Federation of Independent Business versus Sibelius. So I would argue that that um, that purchasing a health service is an economic activity. You're spending you know 500 bucks to receive a medical service. And that there is an interstate dynamic because restrictive abortion laws cause women to, to travel out of state to obtain this service. And that given that there are hundreds of thousands of abortions performed every year, there's a substantial effect on the interstate health market. The Supreme Court is not going to let this kind of interpretation fly, in my view, hmm. because even though it would be consistent with their Commerce Clause jurisprudence, they don't like abortion rights. And so they would probably come up with a new legal standard to restrict Congress's ability to regulate abortion in this manner. So I don't I don't I think that there are political problems in Congress. There are legal problems in the court. And so so more likely than not, it's just going to return to the states. Hopefully their Democrats will be mobilized to turn out in 2022 because of issues related to women's rights, as well as the courts and, and the importance of filling judicial vacancies with with the progressives who will respect women's rights. But we're going to see that abortion is essentially made um, illegal um, in an entirety in places like Ohio and Texas. And um, and we're going to see a lot of travel to places like California and New York for for abortions um, for people, for women who can afford it and people who can't afford it are essentially going to be SOL. You know, you you. I think you had a tweet somewhere about this and I wanted to just get your, your personal opinion on it when, you know, it's always this idea that, that anti-abortion people are also against any government programs or policy or paradigms that help people after they're born from infants all the way through the rest of their life. And, you know, the, the, the anti-abortion argument is we are for the sanctity of life. Once the baby is born, then, you know, the parents and, and the, baby, the baby itself, they have free will to make choices and, and then it's on them. And so we're, we're not we're not being harsh. We're, we're giving the, the baby. I don't know the argument, but that's the argument. And I, I know how I handle that. But I want to know what you what you would say to it. Yeah, I mean, it's frustrating to see that the concern about life only seems to precede birth. <laughs> that you know, if we're going to to compel people to to carry pregnancies to term, it would be nice if 
there were good maternal health care. It would be nice if there were, you know, family medical leave. Uh, it'd be nice if we were investing in early childhood education yeah. better. Uh, it'd be nice if we were investing in a lot of programs to prevent issues like infant mortality, maternal mortality, which we have the highest maternal mortality rate in the developed country, in the developed world. And so we have, we, there are a lot of policy problems that we don't seem to be addressing if we truly do care about, if we do care about life. And so, so I, you know, I have a hard time characterizing anti-abortion uh, individuals as being pro-life unless they are right. going to really confront the full range of, of pro policies and programs that are going to actually promote life once people are brought into this world. Yeah, they definitely won that branding war. I mean, from the jump, they won the policy war, they won the judicial nominee war, and they def they won the branding war, too. I mean, pro-life is, I, know, I haven't used that term since someone scolded me, I don't know, like six years ago in, in conversation, because they're, they're just anti-abortion. Uh, do, yeah. do you have any empathy for the anti-abortion argument when it comes to, you know, it, or, or, or do you, because I usually just... I don't have empathy outside of people believing it. it's their religious, right? Like, I'm like, even then, if I can see that to you, it's still not a legal, uh, your, your religion doesn't trump, you know, the, the Constitution or laws or whatever. It's usually where I end up. Do you have any yeah. empathy for the anti-abortion arguments anywhere? I mean, you know, I want to be sensitive to, I, I do want to be sensitive to religious beliefs. You know, if someone believes that life begins at conception, as long as there's internal consistency with respect to um, to issues like health care, um, you know, ac increasing but access. I dismiss, to I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I usually, dis I, I usually dismiss the religious arguments too, because there's nothing that, in, I don't feel like there's anything in, in anybody's religion, major religions, that says anything about abortion. That's why yeah. I'm like, you can say you have a religious belief, but could you just show me where where that is in your in your yeah. religion? Yeah. And, and I'm not a religious expert. I, I teach religion and politics in my constitutional law classes, but that's it. Um, I, I'm not a religious individual, but, you know, I, I I try not to make it my mission to second guess people's uh, religious beliefs as long as uh, they're not intruding on on other people's. Rights. I make it actually I do. I have made that my mission. <laughs> my new show is second guess your religious beliefs. <laughs> It's like trying to get you to, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I learned it from George Carlin years ago. Well, um, you can't you can't uh, learn from a better person than George Carlin. Yeah, no, I mean, I do. I do. I do. I do like to ask people, you know, critical questions about what, how much that, that, that get them to think about how much they've thought about their religion, because I do feel like there's a lot of religious people that that for whatever reason we could talk about, aren't asking critical questions. And they're yeah. just kind of, you know, they call a lot of people call, you know, our side of thinking sheep or something. But I'm like, hold on a second. Like, I well, there seems to be a um, in some cases, and I, I don't want to point fingers, but some greater emphasis on memorization than comprehension. Um, and, you know, sort of the ability to recite phrases yeah. from the Bible yeah. without actually understanding, you know, issues of, uh, Helping the poor, for example, yeah. and um, you know there there is a certain senator from Florida who was very keen on on tweeting out phrases from the Bible, but then you know we'll do things like vote to cut SNAP benefits, and and there there are certain inconsistencies between between his his religious belief his his purported religious beliefs and and the policies. Well, his the uh, their religion also says that you should help people, but that the government shouldn't help people with your right. taxpayer money. Like I'm all for helping a anybody who's, <laughs> I like something like this, like, like down on their luck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're down on your luck over there. <laughs> the, you've been in uh, the, 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 the school, the prison pipeline down on your luck. Anyway, I'm all for helping them. I volunteer at the, at the thing with the stuff and I help these kids, but I don't think government should do it. My religion doesn't say anything about that. Right. I love that one. That's a fun one to deal with. <laughs> I'm like, well, because you, you can't like that. That you know leads to another question just about political ideology. Like, you, you you can't solve problems with a good idea and a handful of generous people. You have to have a good idea and and some something that enforces the idea so a lot of people can can benefit from that idea. It can't it can't be a libertarian 
you know, a dream in my opinion. It, it doesn't make right. any sense to organize a, a society that way. What do you make of that anti-government strain of, of thinking, Miranda? Um, I get frustrated by it. Um, obviously, it's not my politics. I think that uh, I think that there have been a number of people who have made these anti-government arguments and basically just defunded government to make the point that government is inefficient. It's like, well, sure, government is, in, is, is inefficient the way you do it, but yeah. we can invest in government programs and make them efficient. Well, yeah, it, anything's anything's inefficient if no one works there. Like, yeah, yeah the IRS sucks because you fired everybody. You know, it's like... Right. You know, that that oh, I was going to say something about a, a can the, the candle factories on my mind, that horrible situation in Kentucky. But like, oh, yeah, that was terrible. Like the, you look at the labor practices of some of these warehouses and you're like, yeah, those people should get more of a, a, a share in the company because without them doing the actual work and they'll be replaced soon by robots. But but, you know, still, it's like ridiculous. Um, what was my point? I just think that we should have teachers uh, throwing one dollar bills down their shirt to be able to pay for students Absolutely. resources. That's the America <laughs> or Dakota that I want to live in, Miranda. <laughs> it's that was it was such a an astonishing sight. It was it was very it was bleak as someone who is in education, obviously higher education, so it's it's a little bit different, but um but, you know, it's a really sad commentary on on what our priorities are. And and as we were meant, talking about earlier, you know, it's it's also just astonishing that this sort of, you know, this was a proposal that was pitched to to, you know, PR, you know, PR staffer and someone somehow gave it the OK and thought that this was going to go over well, which is also just an interesting strategic blunder. Yeah. Unbelievable. Who, who how, they were just sitting around. They're like, well, this. What's a great promotional idea, a fun thing for everybody is and, and, and for a good cause. How about like some Hunger Games, Squid Game shit where <laughs> teachers, yeah. I mean, the reaction to that was interesting, right? Like nobody in that room thought maybe that's not great optics. That's bizarre yeah. to me. It's it's really astonishing and um, and just very demeaning. Uh, also, yeah. let's just talk about. The one issue that is most important. Why were they wearing helmets? What were the they, <laughs> so they didn't slip and fall on the ice on the way to the carpet covered in ones? Like I didn't quite understand why they had helmets on. Neither did I. They don't want to bang their heads with the other people groveling for the ones, maybe while they're on their hands and knees. Awful. Just, the whole thing. Yeah. Really, really terrible. All right. Lastly, I wanted to talk with you about uh, January six stuff, insurrection stuff. And, and and where you see this going, how closely you're you're following and, and kind of what it means. I mean, how much are you uh, reading the, uh, the 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 fascism experts, the the historians who cover authoritarianism and the downfalls of democracy? How concerned are you about our system and and everything that that the big lie has really led to? Because it really yeah. I mean, I was thinking about today just real quick and it's like. Dude loses the election. A lot of serious people still saying, don't worry about it. He's going to uh, create a lie, repeats it over and over. Increasingly, people start to believe it. Then they question the entire election system. And then, of course, they work to replace at the lowest levels who's counting and deciding to certify votes, which you can tell us about what the Constitution says about states there. But like, wh wh what do you what do you think about how this entire narrative has unfolded and and frankly i think how effective it's been for trump to repeat this and obviously his supporters in media and congress to repeat it yeah um i'm very concerned um the you know it was it was very disturbing to see the revelation yesterday of the various text messages that were being sent you know highlighting that there was clearly a, an understanding of the gravity of, of what was going on on January 6th. And, and obviously, um, President Trump did not, um, you know, did not step in really to meaningfully prevent the, the extent of violence that we saw. You know, there are, you know, on the one hand, I'm glad to see that the January 6th commission is taking action. Um, I, hold, I hope that people are are held accountable for uh, defying subpoenas and things like that. Um, and, 
you know, I'm, I wish that we were seeing more action from the Justice Department. <laughs> Merrick mm-hmm. Garland has not been the most um, aggressive in terms of defending democracy that I was hoping. But, you know, the, the biggest concern that I have is that there are a lot of members of Congress who seem to still be going along with the big lie. We have in Georgia, um, David Perdue is running and basically yeah. just talking about how, uh, you know, the problems with having certified their results and in, he's running he's, like he's, on a platform of if elected, I will not certify the results yeah, of elections. He's like, literally running against democracy. And so, you know, there's this con- on the one hand, I think that the Republicans will legitimately win the 2022 results, midterm results uh, pretty handily. And so maybe they maybe the the attacks on democracy will be postponed until 2024 when when there's, you know, a more significant contest (laughs) or I shouldn't say more significant contest, but, you know, a closer contest. Do you think uh, do you think I think the answer is that everybody right now has to do something at the local level to pay attention to make sure that people in local government offices are not uh, the uh, fascists. Yeah, I mean, I think that the Democrats could do a much better job of paying attention to local elections. I mean, like people like progressives, like people every I'm sure there's a ton of people listening that do a lot and maybe even have run for office. But I mean, like when you say Democrats, it's it almost sounds like people in off. I mean, like progressive mind, like American people who lean a certain way have to get involved. Now. Yeah, and and you're right that it, it can't just be Democrats. I mean, it, it's it's a very scary thing in American politics right now that only one of the major parties is on the side of democracy. Right, and um, and obviously that should not remain the case. Uh, we need to have a healthy two party system, um, but we need we need to see we need to have people uh, we need to have people running for office who will defend democracy. We need to have people who will hold accountable those who do not run on the side of democracy because it didn't used to be the case that we had to worry about whether the loser of an election was going to concede. We didn't used to have, (laughs) you know, uh, the major leaders in the political party, um, you know, uh, opposed the certification of results that were contrary to their preferences. (laughs) And it's a very frightening state of, of affairs and unfortunately, you know, um, I don't think enough Americans are paying attention uh, to this. I I know that there are a lot of issues going on from um, from you know if, with the pandemic and so forth, but but democracy is an existential issue, um, and uh, it's really in grave danger and it's hard. Yeah, to I, I think to... that if you if you only pay attention around elections then it's too late. It's too late to yeah. do anything. You're all, you say, oh, who's on the ballot? Oh, I'll vote for this person. Like, no, nope, there's nobody. There's, there's in, in my county last year, there was no one to vote for. There was no right. Democrat on the ballot. They screwed it up. Like progressive Democrats in my county screwed it up and there was no one to vote for. And that's why I'm involved now to make sure that at least there's always a, somebody's name on the ballot to vote for right. running unopposed in a county or in a state where you could actually win is is unforgivable, in my opinion. But and we're also seeing gerrymandering, which is another huge you know, problem. I've talked big, about it. Yeah. Concern. Um, that it's just going to make it harder and harder for uh, for Democrats, for for people who care about democracy to to get in the door. And and so from from voter suppression issues to to. Um, with voter suppression, you know, um, restrictive voter ID laws to uh, to gerrymandering to uh, to sort of the inattention on off in off years. I, I have a lot of concerns about. about yeah. How yes. Are We've forward. listed a lot of challenges. So what is your uh, your go to uh, when to relax, to be distracted by and, and be relieved by? I mean, I know you're a big baseball fan, and I am. I, it, I miss so, baseball this time of year. Yeah, so that's um, uh, going to be. You, so you're a, you grew up a Yankees fan, grew up in New York, and now you're moving. Well, I actually grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I grew up a Giants fan oh, and then adopted right. the Yankees when I went to grad school. That's right. I forgot that. I don't know why I thought you grew up in New York, son. You're a, a West Coast I girl. I don't want to be a New Yorker. <laughs> yeah, but you <laughs> are you happy that you grew up in the West Coast? Is it like your childhood? I mean, I like the Bay Area a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, I, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to say that I would have rather grown up somewhere else because obviously I only know 
having well, grown up in the Bay Area. See, but, seeing um, as though you've lived in so many different climates, what do you say to people who always think the you know the the grass is always greener in a in a warmer place, or you lived in California, you've lived in New York, you're currently in Ohio for apparently you were penalized for some purpose, um, and now you have to live in Ohio. And you're at <laughs> Oberlin, great school, but now you're going to Massachusetts. What do you think? What do you make of the the conversation about weather and, and climate in terms of where people live and what's the best? I mean, it's hard to beat California weather. You say I that. I really miss living in Los Angeles. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area, but I, I lived in Los Angeles. Has that weeks. changed as climate has changed? Like, I almost sometimes I wonder, and I sh- people listening can weigh in on this. If you live in this beautiful area, and maybe the Pacific Northwest or, or north, anywhere mm-hmm. in California uh, or the West, really, where these wildfires are, are they ruining life to the point where, like, unenjoyable weather days, you can't go outside because you can't breathe, much less inside? So, so with wildfires, it's definitely nerve wracking. You know, there were, um, I want to say in 2020, uh, some days that we were just unhealthy to be outside. Right. But, but you know, every, no place is perfect. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll take some, you know, because I, because I had the fires have never been, uh, super close to me. I, I can say that I would, I will take, you know, a few smoky days over a right. over okay. long winter. All right. Well, I've um, made uh, I've I've, I've uh, made an argument that may not may not always be accurate to win the argument with my family about what's better, New York or California. Um, but you are. But the bottom line, and this is what I was driving at, is you're I'll now take New York City. <laughs> New York City. I would take New York City over. I'm over, over New York City. Over anywhere. Um, I'm, I'm but... over New York City as uh, because of the period of life that I'm in. Yeah. Like it was awesome for my 20s and 30s. But then I was like, I'm, I'm Jeff good. And I was in New York. So I'm good. yeah, that's it was, it was uh, the perfect time. Uh, but how are you going to be a Yankees fan in Red Sox country? Does that bring you concern? No, not at all. So I grew up a San Francisco Giants fan and moved to Los Angeles and moved to Los Angeles for a couple of years. And I went to Dodger Stadium and rooted against the Dodgers. So at a Giants game. So um, I have I have no hesitation about wearing a Yankees hat at Fenway. Um, I will be definitely going to, to the games at Fenway. I, I love that ballpark. So no, I do I'll just double down. <laughs> oh, good for you. I hope uh, I hope you're safe. Thank you. So I wore um, opposition colors to Fenway once, but it was an Oakland A's game. So it was much. Well, I look, much... I, I look forward to your social media next spring. Um, <laughs> how, how about finally give us a show? Are you watching anything? Are you reading anything? I want to leave on a recommendation for everybody. Any, what oh, is, what yeah. are you watch, What are you uh, binging? What are you doing in your time to uh, entertain and be distracted? So I, to be honest, I've been pretty busy with teaching, so I haven't been watching anything. Oh, yeah, this is the time for con law professors and others to tweet about how miserable they are grading papers. I <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been doing a lot of great. Fortunately, my students are great, but it's it was definitely been a lot. Um, I've actually been so I've this is a show I've already watched straight through, but but I've been introducing my partner to marvelous Mrs. Maisel, and so that's been that's been fun to get to to share with them. That's awesome. Yeah. My wife and daughter watched that and said they loved it. My parents watched it and said they loved it. But I feel as a comic, it felt too close to home. I can't watch yeah. a lot of shows that that depict certain dark parts of a comic's life. I mean, I know mm-hmm. it's a great show, but I'm scared to watch that. <laughs> Even as a, a dude in comedy, it's like, ooh, I can relate. Yeah, there is there's this there is an episode where you just see her honing honing her 10 minute set. And it's like, oh, yeah, I remember. Yeah, all you've done that, of course. Weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you um, doing stand up anymore? Are you going to do it some more? I think I'm going to revisit it in Boston right now. Cool. You know, I'm obviously uh, I teach in a very small community, so there's there isn't a chance that I would want to teach to do comedy. Fair enough. Right <laughs> I don't want my I can, students to be my audience. You can understand um, how that might bring up some issues, <laughs> depending right. on how personal you uh, you get on stage. Yeah, I haven't done a lot of Boston stand up. I've done a little of it, so I'll Great probably scene. revisit it a little bit there. Great scene. I, I feel like it's pretty. This is my uh, opinion. I feel like it's pretty close that Boston comics like take care of each other, and I think they do welcome people into it as well. So. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, yeah. I like the New York comedy scene a lot. So, but it's I haven't done anything since the pandemic because, um, you know, I I couldn't really get on board with the Zoom comedy shows and, yeah, no, and I just haven't wanna, gone to comedy clubs since then. And uh, you know, I've got a lot of like liberal, neurotic, uh, you know, very very New York comedy uh, uh, stuff, and so I don't know how well that would fly in Ohio. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's a, it's a great discussion and topic about how different comedy now, especially now, uh, works in, uh, regionally. It's and I think comedy bookers and in, in the industry is is kind of uh, understands that as well. Like, oh, don't book him in this region. Don't book her. She's going to talk about this or that. And we are the old confederacy. Maybe not the best uh, yeah. night out. I've got a Rachel Maddow joke, and I just don't know how how that would go. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, Dr. Miranda Yaver, as always, I appreciate you joining me and talking to me. Super smart human being. And it's always great to get your your take and look at all things. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yes, it has been always great to talk with such a brilliant political science and constitutional law professor. Love, uh, I love following her Twitter. She's great on Twitter. Definitely follow her there at Miranda Yaver, Y-A-V-E-R. And, of course, Jackie Cashin. Go get her album. Follow her on Twitter. Let her know that you heard her here. Don't forget to make a donation to GiveWell, GiveWell.org, slash stand up. And all of the sponsors, if you got your underwear from Tommy John yet, your toothbrush from Quip, TommyJohn.com, slash Pete Dominic. I mean, stand up. I'm tired. And obviously, getquip.com slash stand up as well. I'm not editing out mistakes, folks. It is time to go. Thank you very much for tuning in today. I am not going to be doing the Hangout Thursday night. I have to do it on Friday night this week. I hope you can join me Friday night at 8 East. I've got the Board of Education meeting to attend. I'm very integral in, in, in our organization and movement to create and do a lot more with diversity and equity and inclusion at our school. And I've got to be there. I can't not. I can't miss it. So I will see. They do that like once a once a month, one Thursday a month, I guess it is. So Friday night, 8 East. I hope to see you there. Thanks for all your good wishes on the new gig at last week tonight. By the way, a lot of people reached out to me for that. If you're still listening, and I assume you are, because everybody listens every minute of the show. Don't you? Don't forget to call the Stand Up Hotline as well. 209 Stand Up. 209-72-6387. That's in the show notes as well, because I know I said it way too fast. And, oh, I keep forgetting to plug the, the dates. Stand-up dates. What am I doing? Stand-up comedy with Ophira Eisenberg and Christian Finnegan. January 15th in King of Prussia. January 16th in Stone Harbor. And January 22nd in, uh, in Stone Harbor, New Jersey. And January 22nd in Beacon, New York. That's it. My voice is kicking out. John Carroll, take over. Experiment if you stand up. Stand All right, up. we got to speak up, we got to reach up and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be toes up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. now no need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try to rise up, show up. To the voice inside And listen well and it'll tell you Not to run and hide It says stand up Stand oh, up got to Stand up Ooh, Come on Just stand up Everybody got to stand up In the darkest hour Stand up People got the power Stand up Come on, come on, come on Come on, come on, come on Come on, come on, come on, stand